Hey everyone, welcome to another live stream of the Engadget podcast. I'm senior editor Devendra Hardwar. Today I'm joined with our reviews editor, Sherlyn Lowe. Hey, Sherlyn. Hola. Hola. And our podcast producer, Ben Elman. Hey, Ben. I'm looking forward to talking about space. So much space today. Uh, it's going to be a space heavy episode. We're going to dive into the Mars Perseverance uh, rover uh, with a special guest. Uh, so that'll all be kicking off soon. Um, just to give you guys a heads up uh, who are watching this live stream, you know, you're basically going to be seeing us produce the podcast. So we can't chat with you during our segments, but we're going to have some Q&A sections. This particular episode, we're going to be recording out of order because our guest isn't going to be able to join us until 11.30 a.m. Eastern. Um, so, uh, you know, just stay tuned. Uh, it's all going to make sense in the final recording. But thank you for joining us. Drop your questions. Uh, we will be taking a look during the Q&A section. And uh, yeah, do you guys want to say hello to anybody in the audience? We, I mean, our no, usuals. Sorry. Our usuals are here. Thank you. As always, hello. Thanks for joining us again. <laughs> the community is amazing. Can somebody check on Bruna? I haven't seen her in a little while. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but hello to Mark Dell, who's here again, as usual, as always, which we are very appreciative of. There is uh, Raj Luthra, I think, from Surrey, England. Hello. Uh, Krishna Gupta, Raju Tatiseti. I'm just shouting out names because y'all made yeah, it a point yeah. to be here. And uh, thank you, nice. thank I, you, thank you. Their niches. I don't know. We're doing the uh, the YouTube streamer good practice of saying hi to everybody. So yeah. hi and yeah. hello, uh, Sherlyn. You're actually best suited for reading off all of these names, just because, like, being from Singapore, like you know, yeah, you have the immediate understanding of how. To <laughs> ben, are you? Are, are, is it? Is this because you saw my tweet from yesterday about tagalongs versus Tagalog? No, no, literally no. It's it's just it was it was a random tweet at like midnight. Sherlyn's like, you know, yeah. it's not the same. Well, it's because okay. I saw a meme nobody, where nobody. someone misspelled tagalong, and I was very annoyed. I was just like, yeah, Tagalogs yeah. are not cookies. Tagalog is uh, a language. I think it's it's but... autocorrect. Go straight to Tagalog when you smart the tagalog. orc yeah. says say hi to me and mark dallas thinks my tv is on fire it sure is pretty it lit. is definitely on fire sherlin has no fire extinguisher so oh boy. Oh, yeah. gotta keep that in mind yeah keep that in mind okay we're gonna kick off the show yes. we're gonna do the we'll intro then we're gonna go into another section at 11 30 a.m we're gonna kind of loop back around to our first section so stick with us everything will make sense <clears throat> are you guys good to go yeah, more people saying hi. We can't say hi anymore. Sorry, but we'll say hi Wait later. Wait for the Q&A. Give us half an hour. Okay. <clears throat> What's up, Internet? And welcome back to the Engadget Podcast. I'm Senior Editor Devendra Hardwar. And Reviews Editor Sherlyn Liu. Today, it's all about Mars once again. Uh, we're going to be chatting about the Mars Perseverance rover. It just landed on the Red Planet this week. And we brought on a very cool guest, Sophia Gutter nazar oh, Let me do that again. We brought on a very cool guest, Sophia God Nasser, to chat about this landing, what it means, why it's so special, and what is going to be going on with this mission in the future. As always, if you're enjoying the Engadget podcast, please be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. Leave us a review on iTunes, and uh, you can always email us at podcast at engadget.com. Okay. Let's go into other news. So I'm going to mm -hmm. introduce okay. the section and throw it to you, Sherlyn. Yeah, and okay. a very clean intro to that because it's really, you know, we're yep. going to say bye to Sophia, all of that stuff. It's Yep, 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 yep. I got it. <clears throat> okay, when you're ready. Yep. Okay, enough about Mars. I'm done. I'm done with Mars. Let's talk about some other tech. Sherlyn, I know you've got a ton of Android news. What is up with Google stuff? Hells yeah. So Android 12 isn't going to be ready for a while. We just saw the first developer preview recently, maybe last week. And uh, that doesn't mean, though, that we don't have any new features to look forward mm -hmm. to. Google's actually been changing up its uh, update cadence, I feel like, uh, in the last few years or so, where it actually just releases like sets of updates as they're ready. It doesn't like wait till a major <laughs> release anymore to share That's them. That's good. I prefer this, honestly. I yeah. like, like a few features here and there. Yeah. 
Yeah, it might make like each new version of Android feel like it's less of a huge update, but you do get these features sooner instead of having to wait around for an arbitrary date. So <laughs> with this set of updates, there's like half a dozen new things. And I think the biggest thing that most of us were excited for is scheduled texts. Scheduled text <laughs> meaning in the messages app. So So only in, you know, text, RCS text or text. Um, you can set a message to send like at whatever time you want. So uh, the practical uses for this are like, if you're texting with someone in a different time zone and you don't want to wake them up. Um, so you, you set a message to, to send only when, you know, they're awake. So like, if you're, I don't know, you want to send a good morning message, but you're afraid sure, you're yeah. not going to be up yet. Or you have random thought in the middle of the night and you don't want to bug your friends. Sure, That's Lynn. what Twitter is for. But uh, yeah. yeah, I also do send a lot of late night text messages. This is very true. All the group chats are of me going like, <laughs> why are trefoils called trefoils or something? I don't know. Um, but yeah. Magnets, how do they work? Yeah. Schedule text is, is <laughs> awesome. And uh, it's one thing I don't think iOS uh, people have yet. So. No, way to rub it in. Me. I know. But we have, uh, y'all have other things that we don't have like a good messaging app anyway <laughs> in addition to scheduled text there are a bunch of other things right there's uh, a new dark mode for google maps that one's been rumored for a long time for a few months now so now if you're driving around in the dark you can use dark mode on google maps and it won't have to scorch your eyes anymore there is e uh an assistant cannot be used on when even when your phone is locked now that obviously prevents some uh, presents some mm. privacy related issues and concerns, but it's a setting that you can enable. So if if you prefer the convenience of being able to use Assistant, even when your phone is locked and when it's far away, it's actually helpful for people who really want to use Assistant hands-free all the time, but sure. don't have a speaker, for example. Um, this is a trade-off you might want to, you might have to make, or you just have to be very careful about your privacy. Uh, and then speaking of hands-free use, there's also improvements made to the talkback screen reader they've uh, google's revamped it to make it a little less clutter they've simplified some of the navigation integrated some of it so the menus used to be very confusing um and then they also added new gestures multi-finger gestures to uh get the screen reader to read you articles uh so if you swipe left or right with three fingers you can change the reading options for articles to from reading headlines only to reading every word to reading even every single character. So just keep swiping to toggle through those. So, you know, I talk a bit about accessibility in my coverage, and this is one of the things that Google is doing. And I think it's not, it's a good thing That's that cool. they're working on it. Yeah, that they yeah. continue to update it. And then the last few updates, generally less important to me, Android Auto. <laughs> I don't drive because I'm in the New York area. So, you know, but there's some updates. You get a new, uh, you can play now uh, voice activated games, Devendra. So the next time you're in your fancy new car and you maybe mm -hmm. have Android Auto, I know you're an iPhone person, but mm -hmm. you could start a trivia game or Jeopardy. That seems uh, like a bad idea, but okay. <laughs> with If you have, if you're on a road trip or something, yeah, um, or you have to entertain the kids or something, mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't, yeah. Uh, and then there's some other features like custom wallpapers for your dashboard, uh, split screen if you have a wider screen and a, a, a privacy screen when you have like people to decide when you show your Android auto screen, uh, if you have someone in the car with you or not. So mm -hmm. just a bunch of updates. I think it's nice. People in Android, uh, people who are on Android may appreciate it. And a lot of these, it's not clear yet just how immediate they will go into effect. Uh, but they're expected in the coming weeks or so. So look at your phone. Keep updating. Very cool. Very cool. Well, yeah. I think there's other news happening too. Sony gave us a brief glimpse of what's going to be coming with the next PlayStation VR that's going to work with the PlayStation 5. Uh, it's not mm -hmm. coming this year, but they were basically, they dropped a blog post that was just like, hey, uh, we like VR. We, we have a new one coming, okay? It'll be <laughs> better. It'll look clear. Um, it's all like very vague. I expect a higher resolution, a wider field of view. Those are all things they kind of reference. Uh, better tracking. Um, and mm -hmm. they even talked about like having a new VR controller, which is kind of interesting because 
right now, Sony relies on the old Move controllers, which are very old. Uh, the Move <laughs> controllers and its old Move camera with the PlayStation 4, you know, those things were around for a while. And I was shocked when I reviewed the PSVR in like 2016 that, you know, it delivered a pretty decent VR experience. But yeah, they need a new controller. So I... if they build, yeah. <laughs> I have what? thoughts on this because I'm just now looking at the picture of, I believe, <laughs> is the PSVR uh, uh -huh. set with the two controllers with the, the orb balls. on the end of the. Yeah. Geez, that's not a, that's not very sophisticated. That looks a lot like <laughs> Lenovo's. Boy, I, I played a Marvel AR MR game with Lenovo's Mirage two years ago, and those it's very similar, yeah. Style, yeah, and it's a. Uh, no, you can do better than that. <laughs> I mean, those move controllers came out really early in the 2010s, too. I believe even weren't yeah. they part of the police station three. I got to look at the history there. Oof. But that's old hardware that they kind of retrofitted to be VR stuff. So I was shocked it worked and it worked pretty well. <laughs> um, the problem okay. was the setup for PL PlayStation VR is a mess, right? Because you need to have the mm. camera, you need to have a giant cable trailing through your living room to the headset. There's like a breakout cable in the headset. There's a, you get to plug in headphones into that cable, I believe. So like, it's a whole bunch of things all at once. So I hope this next version is more streamlined. Give me like, it's probably still gonna be cabled, but give me like a single cable um, built-in headphones with the option of using my own or something. And, you know, better quality and stuff would be nice. But certainly the PlayStation 5 is fast enough to do much, much better VR mm -hmm. than the PlayStation 4. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, it's just, yeah. I have a few questions about this as a budding yes. console gamer. One... You keep saying what... that, but uh, <laughs> what evidence is there other than your... Budding. Story? Budding. Budding. Uh -huh. Um... Here, here's my question. One, what are the VR game titles like on PS versus Xbox? And two, what's the Xbox VR situation? Yeah, I was going to get to that. There, I mean, we oh, still good. don't have anything for Xbox, right? Microsoft, I think, has said that the, you know, the Xbox Series X could run VR. It certainly has the hardware for it, but mm. they have not announced anything. They never did. They didn't touch VR with the Xbox mm -hmm. One series of consoles. It was all like Windows VR. And it even seems like Microsoft is taking a step back from that now. So I don't know. I, I was kind of predicting like maybe they're waiting for wireless VR to become more of a thing, but that would be right. super expensive. That would be, you know, a $500 headset, even just to get the wireless receiver and everything. So we don't know. The Xbox Series X does have a, um, has a USB port up front. For VR, you also need an HDMI jack. So like it's a mm -hmm. whole bunch of things. Uh, Microsoft has no strategy, whereas Sony did a pretty good job of launching the PSVR with a bunch of really cool games. Um, mm -hmm. And some of the early experiences, like there was a Batman one that was super cool. Um, mm -hmm. And even since then, games like Resident Evil 7, were it was updated to support VR. So you could play that mm -hmm. entire game in first person in VR on a pretty old console. So that was all nice. really impressive to me. Yeah. It's one of my favorite games, by the way, Resident Evil. But except for I used to play it in an actual arcade with the actual gun toy things. So I don't. I think you're thinking of a different game. Are you thinking of House, of the, House of the Dead? House of the Dead. Yeah, you're thinking of House of the Dead. Different but house. I did evil. also. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I also did play <laughs> Resident Evil somewhere somehow. I feel like that's very familiar. Somewhere somehow. Maybe I watch the um, movies. Anyhow. <laughs> or you could be thinking of Time Crisis, but yeah, that would be House of the Dead. Oh, I was... loved Time Crisis. Oh, yeah. You had the, arcades. You were lucky. I uh, love my arcades. I had a childhood. This is true. You had a um, childhood with arcades. Um, you know, I miss social things. So hopefully we will get back to a place where we could do things and play games in public too. What else is yes. up with you, Sherlyn? Because yeah. I know you've got I a mean, lot of cool news you're sitting on. I know. So in hardware, in the world of hardware, I think this is a big piece of news. Huawei unveiled its Mate X2 foldable phone. And this is like... It's been a while since we saw Huawei do its uh, foldable phone. We saw a Mate XS, I believe, last year, I want to say, um, which was more durable than the original Mate X. Now, as a mm -hmm. refresher, when the foldable phone war started happening, <laughs> Samsung came out with the Galaxy Fold. It folded inwards upon itself, and that yep. iteration has sort of been the same that format has sort of been the same for samsung meanwhile huawei came out and was like no nah, we think folding outwards is gonna work <laughs> like have the screen bend and face outwards um okay. that was the original mate x or mate 10 or however they want to pronounce was it ever it. released 
we kept it talking about really it. It was really so large scale. Yeah. It, yeah. It, we, we saw it floating around at uh, conventions or whatever. And if it mm-hmm. ever went on sale, it was very limited run. Uh, <laughs> and I don't actually believe it ever did. We had pricing information announced for it, but I don't know how many people actually were able to buy it. Anyhow, that was that was how the mate foldables were, were right? They, they folded, bend, bent outwards. Mm-hmm. The Mate X2 that was announced this week uh, looks a lot more like the Galaxy Fold. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they realize it's a pretty bad idea to have just all they, three out. Yeah, I feel like Huawei probably took a while to figure <laughs> out how to make it more durable. And then we're like, oh, crap, this is not probably not going to work because screens are very fragile. Um, so what happened is now basically there is a eight inch inner screen that folds Mm -hmm. upon itself and then an outer screen, uh, that's 6.5 inches with a slightly different, uh, aspect ratio than the galaxy fold. Um, both of these screens are OLEDs and they have 90 Hertz refresh rates, which Good. These Pretty are good wild. specs. Pretty wild. Yeah. Uh, especially for a flexible screen on the inside. Um, but <laughs> because it's Huawei, a few things to note. One, <laughs> no Google Apps, right? There's not a proper Google App Store in there. You won't have access to your Gmail, G Drive, etc. unless you find a way to sideload. Uh, lots of questions there about that. Uh, the phone will run EMUI 11, EMUI is Huawei's sort of, sort of mm-hmm. Android open source based software, uh, and it's based on Android 10. So this is basically Huawei taking uh, AOSP, uh, which is an open source code and platform anyway, that basically anyone can take and tweak to to their heart's desire okay. um, and not official Android, right? Which is currently on 11 and the developer preview for 12 was just released. So that's uh supposed to come through soon <laughs> we're not sure <laughs> now okay before I, I i explain to you guys some other things about huawei that we want to be careful about let's just yeah. quickly talk about what this device looks like right it looks really thin it looks very nice and having played with the original huawei mate foldable phone i i feel like huawei's hardware is going to be very good huawei has uh-huh. made some really good looking phones in the past we like their laptops too right so we love their laptops their laptops mm-hmm. well a lot very very macbook clone-ish but <laughs> solid sturdy good looking the problem with huawei is that setting aside the accusations of like its security risks here in the u.s like they've you mm-hmm. know come under fire during the Trump administration uh, and were banned. And that's the whole reason they don't have access to Google Apps or the Google App Store or Android anymore. There's also the fact that there's a lot of reports on how um, Huawei is working with or somehow facilitating the Chinese government Mm -hmm. on uh, its really awful treatment of, and I'm going to butcher this pronunciation, Uyghurs, um, which is... uh, sort of like a Muslim community in, yeah. I want to say Northern China. The way I understand it, my my understanding of this issue, by the way, comes from what I've known growing up and mm-hmm. watching a lot of Chinese TV and Chinese TV shows, especially the period dramas, villainize or vilify the what we call Xinjiang, which is that part where the Uyghurs are, more Muslim-based community. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that happened, even yeah. I think even the last Mulan movie kind of did that too. Yes, like the, exactly. the bad guys were the browner Chinese people. Oh, yes, yes. Imagine that. Exactly. <laughs> For the longest time, I also just assumed they were Mongolian because that's sure. uh, what the subtitles were sometimes too. Because <laughs> we didn't really subtitle well in the past, um, so I made that association in my head. Uh, mm-hmm. But anyhow, that's my understanding is obviously a little. The sure. perspective that I have is a bit different, right? I feel like to yeah. me, this has been a long and ongoing issue since way back in the dynasties. Sure. But the concentration camps are new. So, you know, Oy. the alleged so I, concentration I, yeah. camps. Yeah, there's a lot of coverage of that. Be sure to read up on that, all that. We wrote about, uh, there was a report that Huawei tested its facial recognition software that specifically targeted weaker Muslims in China. So mm-hmm. that is, it's awful. It's It's mm-hmm. bad stuff mm-hmm. and... I think a lot of that is why we are not reviewing Huawei hardware. You know, we're not like covering them 
in the same way we'd cover other companies because they're I, we have to wait I, and see what's going on yeah yeah and i'll say this sometimes if you look at engadget and you feel like hey there's something you might not be covering often there will be a reason yeah. uh one of them being questionable practices like this and again to be clear huawei might not actively be the 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 people that are putting uyghur muslims in concentration camps that's the chinese government but its role yeah. here it's tech. Like it's something we don't want yeah. to uh, recommend to people. Like it's, it's kind of kinda like we're not gonna recommend it's it. It's kind of like the IBM situation too, right? Which IBM IBM corporate would love to make everybody forget that its database software was used by Nazis to catalog mm. Jewish people, and that is that is in the history of IBM. A lot of companies, um, you know, in the U.S. rushed to do business with Nazi Germany, and a lot of that's just swept under the rug, you know? So mm -hmm. this almost you, seems like a similar situation. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll also notice that we don't review slash recommend uh, Blink cameras, Amazon's, I believe, mm. Blink cameras, because of the whole data and the sharing your, your streams to law enforcement, that, that controversy. That's Ring cameras. Think, Ring cameras. My bad. Ring, yeah. uh, I think it was, yeah, I think there was another site that called out a few other publications for still recommending Ring cameras. Yep. Um, and I was so happy <laughs> that Engadget <laughs> did not make that list because we, didn't. we made and that also, decision a while ago. We don't cover cameras very much either, but hey, even that's, that's like a personal decision. You know, when I move to a house, um, you know, it, outside of New York City, I need a security system. Um, Ring is still a thing that's recommended for like in-home use because it's just a security system, right? It is currently the best available offering. It is not like spewing data out and surveilling my na neighborhood or anything. So I actually opted for a whole different camera setup. I'll be writing this up eventually. I'm using uh, Arlo, which is Netgear's mm, Netgear. old like yeah. camera thing. Yeah, um, but I have those like, around my house now and a doorbell and they're not sharing data with the police and i really appreciate mm -hmm. that you know i have a there's, bit more control over that yeah if we get into smart cameras there's a lot of different options i mean i personally have used a canary i have nest mm -hmm. um and yeah there's plenty of brands out there like netgear and in addition to amazon's ring now i will say that like ring does offer some new privacy controls now but until we can like get a definitive yes or no, I I think it, it, you'll yeah. see that we we try to make the best like decisions when it comes to our coverage. We got to be a bit responsible, the, right? The so. thing about Ring, by the way, is that uh, you are automatically a part of uh, the Ring neighborhood app, which is the thing where all all captured footage is shared with other people or could be shared to Ring and accessed by the cops. So that's the whole thing. Oof. Yeah, it's not great. Um, I don't like that. Yeah, so so anyway, that's our stance on Huawei. Uh, we haven't made similar decisions around Xiaomi, even though Xiaomi apparently also comes under fire for reported security yep. issues. Um, but know that we can continue to evaluate these situations and then make decisions when we when we have enough information. I think for sure. So. You've got uh, you got some. We got some other news. This is like a news heavy week, Devendra. Right. <laughs> so Jeez. much news. Well, Spotify had. A media event and i knew several of our reporters uh hopped on to cover it because mm -hmm. there was a lot of stuff coming out they confirmed that hi-fi audio so cd quality audio is going to be coming later this year um nice. in select markets we don't know what the pricing is but that would basically bring them in line with title um i believe amazon music and a bunch of other services that do like high res lossless streaming or... uh, lossless i assume or at least like higher fidelity and you know, it's a thing where right now Spotify, the highest quality setting is 320 kilobits per second MP3, which I think mm. to most people and most speakers and everything and headphones, that's going to sound fantastic. Uh, the mm. CD quality version is going to be for the the audiophiles who just, you know, they're the kind of people who keep their CDs around, um, mm -hmm. people who prefer the sound of physical media to streaming. If you can actually hear that, if you have $10,000 speakers, then it will probably make a difference. So that's a good thing. I just don't know how, uh, I don't know how universal this feature is going to be, you know? Yeah. I'm somebody who cares a lot about audio quality. Yeah. I was going to ask if my speakers would make a difference, <laughs> like it would make a difference on my speakers, which are Nest Audio, which are pretty fine. Um, but we'll see. It depends on how expensive your stuff is, right? If you have $1,000 yeah. headphones, if you have speakers that cost $5,000 or more, 
maybe, maybe you'll hear something, but even then you have to be in a quiet environment. You have to like sit there and really focus and listen. So high res audio is not like day-to-day -day audio, right? Like if mm -hmm. you're commuting or walking around the neighborhood or something, you're probably not going to really hear the benefits of that stuff. Yeah. So it's cool. It's coming. It seems like a little late because I think there were reports since 2017 that Spotify was exploring this. And, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see how they do it. Uh, also because bandwidth is an issue too. Those are much bigger mm -hmm. files. Spotify, um, when Spotify launched, I talked with some folks like who used to work on the architecture of it. And there's like a bit of BitTorrent action going on to help like Spotify oh, spread out that makes sense. data. I don't know if that's still happening, but the initial Spotify architecture was like, there was a bit of data sharing going on. Yeah between the app. Um, I don't know if that's still happening, but I, it'll be interesting to see how they deal with that. Um, as people get 5G and things like that, you'll have access to bigger files you know, on the go, so that's nice. Uh, another major thing they announced is a, I don't know, the most dad <laughs> podcast sound ever, like yes. dadcast. Uh, Obama across Bruce Springsteen podcast, yes. where they just sit around and... Um, talk about being cool dudes and you, you sit it. and you uh you know you sit and you put your leg over each other and you just stare at each other That's as like uh, boomer dads it's uh it's pretty great um it's going to be the second show produced from the higher ground production company that the obamas own this series is gonna be called renegades born in the mm. usa yes. great title come on um it's gonna be an eight episode show talk about race fatherhood marriage and the future of america so that's a thing um <laughs> It's kind of it's kind of fun. Uh, I believe, wasn't there a clip going around? I think one of the first things that went viral from this was that Obama was talking about um, how he punched a guy in the face who called him a racial slur. So you're going to learn oh, okay. all sorts of stuff from our nice. former president. Yeah. Nice. And everyone's like, yeah, good on you. Yeah, I'm here for it. Sure. <laughs> um, I, are you going to be listening to this, Sherlyn? Do you care about oh, Bruce Springsteen? Yeah. You live in New Jersey, so you, exactly. I think you're. I live in Jersey. I feel like I have required to. to. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I was gonna say I might be. They might take back my driver's license. <laughs> my undriver's license. Your undriver's um, license. Yeah. Yeah, but that story about Obama punching someone out. Yeah, I'm here to listen to it. I want to <laughs> find out more. It's kind of cool. Um, it does make me wonder because I think about like the state of the podcast market mm -hmm. and everything, and. When it's it's just all these big names, you know. It's like when yep. major every comedians celebrity has one. come yeah. in, every celebrity has one. It's like easy money because you can get ads pretty easily. Mm -hmm. um, or companies like Spotify is paying for this, you know. So they're paying Obama and Bruce Springsteen to make a podcast that all the dads everywhere will be listening to. Yep. Um, it does make life harder for yep. I think independent podcast producers, yes. uh, people like us who are like. Uh, let's talk about the news. Let's try to make like a oh, yeah. episode people will care about. It is uh, it is tough. Damn these yes. famous people. <laughs> Trust me. I have so many podcast ideas that are sort of in the works slash sort of being talked about. And they're not, mm. they're just not going to, because I'm like considering the saturation of the market, the staggering yes. odds we're working against. Yeah. I'm like, oh, nobody's going to, nobody's going to listen to my podcast. So and by this, I mean my offshoot Sherlin's show, whatever. Not Sherlin thoughts. The lowdown, the download. Yeah, the download. Um, but but <laughs> the tea. <laughs> uh huh. Uh -huh. But, but you know, uh, I even have at least a few more, you know, followers than most people do. <laughs> And I already you're, like you're a minor and, celebrity. <laughs> not, I don't even like that word. I'm not. I'm I'm barely even known. But <laughs> imagine if you're a regular Joe or regular Jane or you know, and you want to start your own podcast. Yep. It feels like it's so easy to do, but actually think about all the celebrities that people celebrities, have been followings for. They've ruined it. They've ruined podcasting. I don't know. So yeah, it is very easy to produce your shows. There are actually services now that are make it easier than ever recording shows together, editing online. It's all a thing with something like Zencaster, but yep. discovery is a problem. So actually to, to wit, uh, because of that, uh, Spotify says it's also going to be building machine learning tools to help mm -hmm. people um, discover new podcasts. So that's kind of, I think that's pretty cool. Um, Cause right yeah. now the other, the other big problem is discovery where there are a ton of good shows and iTunes and other podcasters will like highlight the, the hottest things or the things everybody's downloading. But there's so much stuff out there. You need a smart way to like detail. What do you like? What do you like to listen to? Mm -hmm. What can I recommend to you? So it sounds like they're taking 
their current music engine, like the stuff that they're already doing to recommend music to people, they're kind of going to do that for podcasts too. So yeah, it's cool. Yeah. I, I like to see how that works out because I already mm-hmm. get a lot of podcast recommendations on um, Spotify and it's basically the podcast of all our rival publications. So. <laughs> how dare you? you? Yeah, you podcast. need a how dare you button. <laughs> Here's all the other people that you might want to listen. I'm like, no, I'm not going to listen. Here are all your mortal enemies. <laughs> yes, Please listen. Please listen. Them. Um, so yeah, podcast discovery is good. I know a lot of people like Spotify for podcast listening. And honestly, I'm warming up to it too, because it's like, I don't, I don't want to put like my good podcatcher, the one with like all the shows I really care about, uh, that get downloaded to my phone automatically. I'm not going to just subscribe to everybody, but podcast Spotify is a way to just like tune into an episode really yeah. quickly. Um, and then decide later Keep if you like want to subscribe to it. Um, yeah, yeah, so that's cool. Uh, another cool thing is Spotify announced they're hitting into 85 new markets across Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, and Europe. Um, it's pretty cool because if I ever go back to my uh, birth country of Guyana, South America, they're finally going to have Spotify mm-hmm. access. Um, so that's cool. Cool for all those countries. And also when we can travel internationally again, I think it's going to make a big deal. Um, pre-pandemic, one of the coolest things about traveling was like going to different Netflix. countries to see what Netflix looked like, right? Yes. Yeah. Because yes. Netflix is global, they own so much content, and then different movies show up in different countries because of rights. Mm-hmm. So even between the U.S. and Canada, there are some very different things on Netflix, right? It used to be pretty. Uh, it used to be pretty bad in the sense that, like, some countries like Singapore, where I obviously would travel a lot to, didn't have any yeah. good titles at all. But recently, and I think in the last two or three years, it changed to the point where like Asian countries have more licensing rights or something under in, in Netflix to the big mm-hmm. blockbuster style movies, and then not in the <laughs> U.S. So I started getting excited. Like I used to before I prepare for a trip to Asia, I have to like, you know, Netflix download or like prepare mm-hmm. myself to watch some content. Uh, that I might not be able to see in Asia. Now I just go with an empty slate. I'm like, I'm going to watch everything they've got in Netflix Asia. Except for your the, tri- the trip there. You need like something for that 16 hour flight. Yeah, but yeah, once sure. you're there. Well, you know me and loving to watch the in-flight entertainment. Or staring at the in-flight game behind the scenes. Yes. I do know you. Zombies. Yes. Let's talk about dying things because of the mm-hmm. pandemic. Uh, easy oh, yeah. segue into Fry's Electronics, the... Mm. I know the uh, renowned, the infamous West Coast electronics store. I have never been to one, but it's a giant store that was mm-hmm. kind of famous for having like themed uh, outlets, like different ones. Like there's one with mm-hmm. like a UFO crashed into it. Huge stores that kind of sold everything, but also sold a lot of like specific geeky tech. Um, seems like a Radio Shack crossed with a Best Buy. They never really made it to the East Coast. So I never got to go to a prize. Mm-hmm. I could only see the ads online. And that makes me sad. Um, they wow. kind of unceremoniously just closed all the stores this week. They didn't put out a big announcement or anything. There was rumors going around on the internet, on Instagram and Twitter, um, where people noticed like, uh, yeah, this store is empty. And they went in to get something and people were like, yeah, we're going to shut down the website later tonight or at least, you know, close everything that's still open. So mm-hmm. RIP Fries, I don't know if you have any thoughts, Roland. Did you have like good geeky stores in, in Singapore <laughs> yeah. that actually sold hardware? The reason I laugh is because uh-huh. the, there's apparently a few Singaporeans that watch our podcast and then <laughs> I mentioned going to Singapore to buy something from an electronic store. They always shout out the same few names. We have. We have like some uh-huh. malls known for and it's called Simlim Square or Funan the IT Mall. And uh, they're mm. not themed so much as they're just the two spots. Apparently you can just go <laughs> and get really good electronics for, for fairly cheap compared I to can like, imagine, the big box stores. All those electronics aren't being made far away from Singapore, right? So you right, guys have easy far. access to them. Um When we went to my first trip to Computex, so that would be my first trip to Taipei, I went to one of the tech malls there. Taipei has several tech malls. So uh, check out that story in Gadget because there's a lot of photos. And it's really cool to have like, just walk through a mall and have one store all owned by Asus ROG or one store all with Racer. You know, and you can Mm -hmm. go in there and play with the hardware. Um, I found some really cool tchotchkes and battery, cute battery packs and for it, my wife yeah it's some like weird stuff let's be honest some of the stuff i've seen in those malls are weird enough that i need like a nc16 warning to talk about them here so it's very weird and once you get into like the the anime theme things like things get <laughs> things get mm-hmm. a little dicey really quick um i also want to talk about something else that uh ended this week cinefx magazine which is 
if you go to a newsstand, if you ever went to like Borders or Barnes and Nobles when those things were open and looked in their magazine section, there would always be this gorgeous um, color magazine with amazing photos on the front right next to Entertainment Weekly and all the other film stuff. Um, and that's Cinefix. It was all about the visual effects industry. It's been around for 40 years, um, detailing like the magic of movie making, you know, how people actually created special effects. And uh, they did it for both practical and digital effects. Uh, they also announced this week that this latest episode, uh, the one featuring the Mandalorian and the child, um, is going to be their last because the pandemic oh. made it very difficult for them to keep running a print magazine. Honestly, I'm shocked that they were able to keep it going for so yeah. long. Yeah, advertising like disappeared for them. Stuff to cover disappeared because uh, it was harder to get access to companies and people weren't producing as many TV shows and movies. So I just want to point this out. I wrote up a post in Gadget called Farewell Cinefix. You unlock oh. the magic of VFX for everyone uh, with some you know, uh, notes from people in the industry. Um, ILM, I think, uh, was the first one to announce this news on Twitter. Um, Corey, Bar Corey Barlog, the director of the God of War series, said, uh, you know, it was the thing that helped him see the world of VFX in the Midwest. Um, who else? Also, somebody I know, uh, John Lepore from the VFX studio Perception in New York City, yeah. uh, gave us some good quotes about, you know, what it was like ex finding Cinefix for the first time, the influence it had on him. And, you know, this magazine's kind of led to his work, his life in VFX. And that's something we also covered in Gadget too. So check out our feature on Perception. Um, I'm really sad because I <laughs> like physical magazines. I like big, glossy magazines. There really weren't that many devoted yeah. to movies. And especially like this is a geeky magazine. Like they have pages and pages of interviews, really in-depth articles, really technical stuff, which I think the Engadget audience will appreciate. So um, I had pinged them to see if they can survive digitally in the future because they did have an iPad edition, but the bulk of their like work was about this print copy. So I, I hope it comes back somehow because there's still room for in-depth technical coverage of movie making uh, on the internet and in general. And it's sad that this thing is going. It's a, it was a beautiful thing. I have some old copies sitting around somewhere. It's just, it's so sad. Did you ever see this magazine, Sherlyn? Not this one, uh, mm -hmm. but I remember when I used to work at Laptop Magazine and uh, I j had joined right after they decided that, that would the last edition they made would be the last yeah. physical copy. Yeah. And that All was a real bummer. Yeah. yeah, totally. It was yeah. my fault, really. I brought <laughs> I brought the jinx. But uh, it, it was like a, definitely like an era that's past us, right? Like it, yeah. we all, for, I think there's people that are living today that don't know what a physical magazine really feels no, I like. Mean, I, I, I think the kids know what like you've had. I know them. what it is, but yeah. have they, like, when you when that when the excitement yeah. of that hitting your mail sure, like your your sure. physical post box, or for me, I got the Newsweek <laughs> magazines in schools, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. eh, the exclusivity, like yeah, of only getting information from these magazines that is certainly gone because everything's on the internet. But I love new magazines. I love gaming magazines. I love smelling. <laughs> A new magazine when it came I in. Guess with what, like though? That smell. You yeah. know, you, you uh -huh. know what? Mag physical magazines are still thriving. These uh -huh. entertainment celebrity gossip rags, they're sure. still around. And I still feel like we could save a few trees. <laughs> we'll see. Anyway. We could save a few trees and brain cells and whatnot by yeah. reducing no. coverage of that. <laughs> oh, well. Farewell, Cinefix Magazine. Uh, if you see any floating around, I'd recommend you pick one up. It's 15 bucks. Uh, but you get some really good info. And if you like The Mandalorian, uh, that latest issue will certainly be a good thing to have. Mm. All right, let's take a break here. Yeah, that's a good the Q &A. place to put a pin in it. Um, I feel like we have a lot of good questions, too. Yeah. Yeah, speaking uh, of... Before, but, sorry, uh, sorry. Just, I just wanted a quick shout-out. Dev, do you remember when CNET did a physical magazine? <laughs> no, I do remember. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it was, a good, it was good to find an airport. I remember walking into an airport and there was a CNET magazine and it was only a couple of years ago, but I, I picked one up because I was like, yeah. this is cool. Yeah. This is cool. Let's yeah. bring it back. I bought yeah. two. As in, I, they had two editions that were yep. print and then I bought both of them and then that was it. Yep. So hey, and Gadget had an iPad magazine, but go ahead, Ben. Speaking of smelling magazines for just a second. Uh, Love it. The, <laughs> uh, I, I distinctly remember 
the smell of new magic cards, like mm. Magic the Gathering, and how <laughs> certain glossy print things, yes. either textbooks or magazines, would smell the exact same way. <laughs> and like, that's just... Yeah, cancerous was, glue material. Well, yeah, cancerous <laughs> glue material, but yeah, can't beat it. Can't really, beat it. Like... Can't beat it. It was never magic cards for me. It was more like X Men cards and like Marvel Cinematic, not Marvel Cinematic Universe, but Marvel. I still have like a pile of X Men trading cards in my desk here that I've had since <laughs> I was an elementary school kid. It's it was the stuff I loved growing up. You know, I have so many Pokemon trading cards that are apparently coming back right now. So you can yeah. sell some of those. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're I was about to say part. like those X Men cards might be worth something also, but uh, yeah, they're Pokemon outside. definitely. Yeah, they're, Pokemon they're definitely. out of the packs. So, mm-hmm. um, like Cornell Waugh uh, said, God that um, Xiaomi Mate X is so baller. The Huawei Mate X, yeah. yeah. He, he then corrected oh, himself and yeah. said Huawei. Oh, Huawei. Yeah. Uh, oh, yes. First yeah. of all, yeah, first of all, shout out to uh, Cornell, also Booters Grow, <laughs> Motorcycles Madness. Um, <laughs> Uh, we have some other familiar names. Cornell is a familiar name, and Cornell, I believe, if I am not wrong, is also one of the uh, candidates or mentors for the platform agnostic program this uh, round. So, hi, That's Cornell. Very cool. That's very cool. Um, Cornell also mentioned that there was a fries in Georgia, and that is something I learned actually not too far <laughs> from me. Uh, I did not learn this until <laughs> go see it. Oh, but, uh, but yeah. So apparently, we have a micro center here that is one of the best reviewed retail outlets I've ever seen. So I'm going to stop by there. Mm. Like once things are a little I safer. I love micro yeah. center. You can get so many things there. That's good. I've never we had one. We had some in New York too, but they were also so inaccessible. It was like industry city, and I lived in Brooklyn. And it's just like annoying to get there. <laughs> Like Micro Center is one of the few places where you could actually go, and I'm not sure if you could build a whole a you could, whole PC. You could. Yeah, like yes, they had cases and they had like you could go around the aisles and yeah. actually like look at all of the different cards and stuff like that. Now, in the time of uh, <laughs> like extreme um, e-commerce, is actually like a benefit. Uh huh. Slightly nostalgic benefit. Slightly nostalgic. It's still um, this. I'm surprised. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also wanted to say just uh, hello to Daniel Cocking because he's also a familiar name. But uh, Mark had a lot of good like comments slash questions. Uh, Mark was talking about Mark Dell, by the way. First of all, can you play solitaire with your voice? That is a, that is an Easter egg question because you know I used to play a lot of solitaire. So thank you. Used you. to. You used to. I don't anymore because I've moved on from. Solitaire to two dots, and now I all I play is Duolingo. Okay. Um, so yeah, what <laughs> language in Duolingo? I've I've done quite a bit of Spanish, so I feel comfortable-ish in Spanish now, but I'm starting to pick up Korean, and Korean is hard. Korean is <laughs> so hard. Oh, my gosh. I also do Chinese lessons just to tell them how wrong they are. <laughs> that's it. That's more in character, I'd say. Yeah. Yes, it's very in character. But uh, Mark also asked uh, about Death Punk's split. Mm-hmm. Have you been? Have you been? You it's know, true. any feels about Death Punk's split? Uh, Dev Big and feels. Ben? It broke my heart. It broke my heart. And also the epilogue video. I don't know if you guys saw. Mm-hmm. Just, I did not. One of the robot yeah, I... men walking away and exploding himself. Oh like no! A very no. Death Punk ending. That's and so it was like sad. the other like waving him by. So it's. I almost wonder if like that one the one side of Death Punk will be its own. You know, his own solo thing eventually. But yeah, I mean, Random Access Memories was such a perfect yeah, album. So and also the Tron yeah. Legacy soundtrack, which everybody talks about. Mm-hmm. They just released some new tracks from that. Oh. They're good. I grew up with Daft Punk. Like all the all their 90s stuff kind of reshaped the way I listened to music. So it was them. It was Prodigy. It was Tricky and Massive Attack. Like in the late 90s, like I was, that was me. That was my music, you know? I'm very annoyed mm-hmm. that they didn't do a live 2017 they yep. did 1997. They did 2007. I was a little bit too young for both of those. Yep. I was like, when 2017 was rolling around, I was like, <sighs> yeah, absolutely. I will like sell a kidney to mm-hmm. see Daft Punk at like Madison Square Garden or yep. wherever they would be. And they didn't do it. Oh, um, Mark Dell said uh, the epilogue video was actually a clip from their movie. I oh, can't yeah. tell if this is a joke. I'm sorry. Oh well, I mean they they did uh, like that movie Interstellar five 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 or something like that. Oh yeah, was it? Uh, hmm, I do not recall. I have not seen the movie. Um, 
me neither. The only movie I know associated with Daft Punk is Tron. Like basically, so. just an extended music video, as which I I'm I'm it's all kind of for. Like, yeah, it's it's kind of like anime, like extended music video, and yeah, it has a story, but like there's no dialogue, so it's. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, like one of those things that you could absolutely see playing in a college dorm anytime, like at For 3 sure. a.m. anytime between 2004 uh, and current day. That was certainly that was certainly me. Um, I know a lot of people are worried about like what the next Tron movie because there is another one coming. Yep. Um, like who's yep. going to do the soundtrack? And I'm thinking like exactly. Well, give me give me one half of Daft Punk and <laughs> a Ludwig dose of Janelle Monae. Trent Reznor. Ludwig well, Gordon, oh, sure, but Janelle Monae Res- like as like vocals Ooh. and other other Ooh, you know aspects trent reznor is too dark trent uh, reznor is too dark although he can i mean they've been doing funny stuff uh he's pretty good he went Rosh jazzy Zuka. for soul yeah. like he yeah uh oh yeah that's right and uh, mm-hmm. i just said raj luther's name because that exactly the comment they made was they were hoping that Def, Def punk would return for tron 3. Yep. everybody and, was and it, eventually gets me oh man so. let me let me just tell you guys like that daft punk soundtracks the movie so so fine right but it did it come out the right before comic-con or right around comic-con i was there those years when they were like showing off early footage from tron legacy and like the music was just everywhere so i directly tie those soundtracks to my sensory experience of going to those amazing mm-hmm. comic-cons before it became even worse and i think hollywood mm-hmm. studios kind of gave up on comic-con but it was a good time yeah uh interstellar also, underscore prasad m says namaste from india hi from mm-hmm. new york area hi uh while we're still marginally talking about um like french house and stuff like that <laughs> can't, can't not talk about justice just mention justice justice. Justice. And, justice. And walking away. justice justice is that actually how they pronounce it i the frenchman yeah that's yes, how so, i've heard yes, them pronounce those, it but those yeah french guys those french guys um, I just know one of them, one of the guys in Justice is like really short. And so like he stands on a bunch of like boxes yeah. so that they're about the same height when they're wow. doing The Napoleon of the electronic music yeah. industry, I guess. Oh no. Um, the French knew electronic really well. Air. I love air. You know, that was a big hmm, thing. I've never heard of air actually. Oh, so, you've definitely I've heard, heard of air. air supply though. Hey, air there supply. There was also... A little bit of talk of like um, bringing back older magazines. Mark Dell was talking about uh, Zap and Crash, which are <laughs> like UK um, UK uh, technology magazines. Um, D- yeah. Daniel Cocaine, sorry. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you were finished, Ben. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Daniel Cocaine says, are, is fries really closing or are they just baiting pe- to get people to do a fries stonks the way games stop? Uh, <laughs> It seems they're dead. Yeah, it seems like they're dead. Like it, it re- actually would have been smart for them to do that because, or maybe it was just too far gone by time. Um, like the GameStop stonks. I mean, people have been saying those stores have been empty for months, basically. Uh, yeah, and the pandemic didn't help. Yeah. It also feels oh like God. Fry's is so much more regional than GameStop is. Oh, it was definitely purely West Coast, and then like the yeah. I saw there were two stores in Georgia. Somebody told me late last night, and yeah, I learned too late. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we can. Yeah, get we're good. On if we don't have more questions, we will finish up. Yeah, we will finish up the other aspects of the show we've got. We will do another Q and A round uh, right before eleven thirty. We're going to take a live stream pause, and we're going to bring on our guests, and then we'll be chatting about the Mars Perseverance rover. Yeah, lots of questions in the chat about why are we not talking about Mars yet? We will get there. We're doing things a little out of the Because, and just so you guys know, like it is, we're an East Coast show. Like we're all East Coast. So if we start at 10 a.m., that is 7 a.m. for folks on the West Coast. So to be nice to guests, uh, I like to push them like as close to nine or later uh, their time as we can. So that is why that's happening. 11.30 is what, 8.30 for them. So uh, that's not too bad. A slightly more civil of doing things it is really hard for people to come you know give you time for free basically so it is all a gift from everybody so i try to work around our guests yeah so let's talk about google ai i was just sure. reading that article last night yep okay i will throw it to you shalin <clears throat> unless you want to do you want to kick it off and just jump into it either yeah, way works shalin should do that go for it go for it then. we want to frame this as like sort of uh under working on yeah, well, it's a, I say around Engadget is like what Engadget is working on. So it's all kind of similar, I'd say. Mm-hmm. All right. 
All right, so before we get to what Devendra and I have been working on, I wanted to shout out a few things that other Engadget team, team members have done this week, uh, starting with Andy Andrew Tarantola, who we affectionately call Andy. Uh, he recently published uh, an, a primer uh, or an article called What's Going On at Google AI? And I think this is a story that has been unfolding for a long time now, as, you know, when ever since uh, a former Google's uh, AI ethicist, Timnit Gebru, or mm -hmm. Gebru, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, um, tweeted in December about a very iffy resignation slash termination uh, that that happened at, for, you know, at Google. So basically her, their tweet was, uh, Quote, apparently my manager's manager sent an email to my direct report saying that she accepted my resignation. I hadn't resigned. I had asked for simple conditions first and said I would respond when I'm back from vacation. But I guess she decided for me. So it's it's just yeah. it's not cool. That happened in December and things have been going on since. It's I just mean, been it's snowballing and escalating, right? Like it's only gotten oh, worse. Yeah. And Google is not doing anything to kind of make it better. Yeah. There's not a very good answer for what happened. So <laughs> for you for for everyone listening and watching and wants to and wanting to know what's going on here, uh Andy's article is a very good way to get mm -hmm. caught up. Um not to give away his whole story, but just to kind of um give you some background. Uh AI and ethics. That's a huge thing. There, there's, there have been AI. Google's like, I don't know what to do with this. Uh, fire them. That's right. That's fine. Yeah. But let's, uh, I mean, if we take it even further back, if we zoom out even more, right? Like there have been ethical boards or, or associations to look at the ethics of AI for true. years now, since really AI started getting thrown around as a buzzword. Um, and I, my, my, my cousin is like a lawyer in Singapore who recently published a report about uh, criminal law and AI. Like mm -hmm. there's governments, he's, he's doing that for the Singapore Academy of Law. And like there's governments actually looking at the ethics of letting AI run our lives too, sure. right? When, yeah. when AI commits a crime in a self-driving car, it hits someone, who's to blame? That sort of question needs to be asked. And there's a lot of ethics there. Google also had their own ethics department and group when it came to their AI. So Timnit... Uh, Gebru, I think, was um, involved, or, or actually, I believe, was leading was one the, of the leaders. Yeah, part. one of the yeah. leaders, as, uh, along with uh, Margaret Mitchell, who is mm -hmm. a computer scientist who specialized in algorithmic bias, and they both flagged issues that said some of these AI and some of these algorithms they're mm -hmm. just not good for minority groups. They're harmful. Well, the, effectively specifically, harmful. like they were the ones that uh, did the study that facial recognition does not recognize people with darker skin tones very well. And that is inherently racist. And I feel like one thing, one thing people talk about, especially in the tech community is like, oh yeah, AI, the cool thing about AI is it's completely neutral. There's no bias or anything it's involved, not, it's not, it's but not. somebody has to program the AI, right. that initial well, data comes it. from somewhere and train it. Right. So yeah, that initial info comes from somewhere. They did a good job of highlighting the kind of flaws in what Google was doing, but yeah. wasn't the issue like, I think it Timnit was, basically yeah. had a paper, right? That was going to say like a specific thing Google was doing yes. is inherently bad and they yes. shouldn't do it. So, it seemed like Google didn't yeah. like that. Yeah. It, absolutely. Again, you can get yeah. all the details on the article, but to, to answer what Devendra said, yes, the, this, Gabriel's dismissal, it happened in December after she co-authored a research paper talking about Google's trillion parameter AI language model mm -hmm. um, that is designed to mimic language. And she argued, she and her team argued that it could harm minority groups um, saying that they don't believe enough thought has been put into the potential risks associated with developing these and mm -hmm. that there's not been enough strategies to mitigate these risks, which are very fair questions to yeah. ask in an early stage research paper. Um, and to be clear that, that uh, research that her and Margaret Mitchell did about darker skin tones being not recognized by AI led to some, I believe led to some improvements, if not directly, then indirectly, right? About how our camera algorithms expose for darker skin tones. That's it's real. Yeah. Google has since highlighted. Now, I mean, mm -hmm. I won't say they're effective, but Google itself, when it launched mm -hmm. Meet hardware uh, last year, said we're working on improving camera algorithms to better recognize yep. faces of people with darker skin tones. Yep. They acknowledge that. So, yep. 
something's happening. I mean, there's still reports right now, like kids in schools who need to take virtually proctored tests. Uh, one thing uh, those those software programs typically do is like uses a camera to make sure you are you and it recognizes you and you're sitting there and you're not like right. looking at your phone or something, right? And right. a lot of students are saying like, they really have to crank up all the lights in their room and like put a spotlight on themselves to make the software know they're actually there. So these are important questions. The weird thing is that Google basically objected to her doing that initial paper about the uh, AI language model um, and just completely dismissed it. And the, first they asked her to completely, you know, take herself out of that paper, I believe, like just not be a part of this. She refused. Um, the conversation with her was like, can we talk about this somehow? Um, and then that's when they had fired her during her vacation. People came to her defense. So other folks on her team and Google, what was it? Um, Mitchell, her co, her, yeah. your co, her co, like colleague in the ethics AI group, mm -hmm. uh, Margaret Mitchell was locked out of her account after she started speaking out too. And like, that's a lot of weird things. And then most recently Google announced like they're reorganizing the whole ethics, a the ethical AI team. Um, except they didn't tell the ethical AI team. Yeah. So well, it never feels good uh, to be moved I mean, around in ways you don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, sort of tying back to our earlier conversation on uh, how Engadget sometimes covers things, right? I think that yep. each little piece of this developing saga story um, <laughs> is not something that we would hit piecemeal. We wouldn't hit each little thing development i don't know that we would i'm, I'm not sure it depends. but it depends yeah it, it depends I, on I think the initial story is something we should have hit i forget if we actually that were there at the beginning we yeah. may or may not have i'm not yeah. sure but we often also have to wait till we can get the facts confirmed and then so yeah. sometimes it just makes more sense to do a longer story like this that can get all of the facts and the story and the timeline right and so i think if you want again to catch up on what happened here Go yep. check out Engadget.com. The title or the headline for the story is what's going on at Google AI. It's a good primer. Um, yeah. It's a very good primer. Uh, so another uh, the thing that was published this week was Nicole's review of the Amazon Echo Show 10. Uh, one of the reasons I bring it up is because it's one of our few <laughs> like big product reviews this week. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> And it is an interesting device. This is basically a smart display with a rotating like, right. base so that it the will- The screen keep, moves around, right? Yeah. Right. To face you whenever you talk to it. So it doesn't matter where you are <laughs> related to the device itself. The screen will always face you, uh, which can be good. Like if you if you have your um, smart display situated in like a kitchen on a kitchen island and you're just like constantly walking around talking sure, to it- sure. <laughs> Could be very useful, except for this is a two hundred and fifty dollars smart display, uh, compared to Amazon's other smart display, the Echo Show Eight, which has very similar features but is smaller and does not rotate, and it only costs one hundred and thirty dollars, so almost yeah, twice the price. They've pushed the cost down of these screens quite a bit. I think the Echo Show mm -hmm. Ten used to sell for like two hundred when it initially came out, but mm -hmm. even then, two fifty for a screen like this, like that's not that much i'd say like it's given the tech involved expensive. here yeah, yeah um, especially when you consider that others in the space let's say the nest hub max or yep. what 99 or three and upwards um so i understand that's still <laughs> like amazon's thing is still like more affordable than the competition mm -hmm. um but the the basically uh -huh. Nicole's review makes it pretty clear like why or what are you getting and and you know who would be the right person to buy this sort of a device? And to be clear, 250 is still a good price. So yeah. my personal takeaway is that like, if you're more in the Amazon ecosystem than you are anything else, this is probably more for you. And mm -hmm. if you're in the Google ecosystem, then a Google smart display is probably more for you. Mm -hmm. Well, also like, I think the question of uh, surveillance is like the big thing here too. Like that is always the trouble with the Echo and the show. Uh, devices anything with Alexa but now this is one that can literally just follow you around the room so you can't even like hide from it in certain ways so you know it's uh it's up to you if you buy this you kind of know what you're getting into if you buy something like this but Amazon owns Ring and one of our issues with Ring that we were talking about was those like surveillance and privacy issues as mm -hmm. well um I own Echo devices like I actually own the Echo Studio. I bought it last year. That's a $200 speaker that has some really good tech in there. So compared to something like the HomePod, you know, like I would rather invest in that. But 
I am also aware of the privacy concerns. Um, any of these speakers are are tough. Would you buy this, Sherlyn? No, because uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I only really have one or two smart displays. Both are Google, just because uh -huh. I, I like having my Google Photos display easily. And I'm more in the Google ecosystem. Like I have a Chromecast, Google <laughs> TV, that sort of thing. It just all works more seamlessly. You have together. the G tattooed on your arm. Like I get it. You love Google. J oh G yeah the G sure. yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> but that's what uh that's what some of the uh other teammates uh, at Engadget have been working on Devendra what about you what have you been working on uh I'm still working on the review for the MSI GS66 I've been talking about it's taken a while because video has been tough we uh, I sent it to our video producer Brian O and uh, he just we couldn't get the game stuff working or the game capture. So we're going to have a video of that soon, but the actual review will be up later this week. Uh, I think it's notable for being one of the first 1440p uh, gaming laptops we've seen. Mm -hmm. um, it has RTX 3080 in it. It's a cool laptop, but there are some issues. The fans are super, super loud. So my yeah, review is a little mixed on it. Um, I'm also planning for Microsoft Ignite, um, which is a pretty... It's more of like an industry focused, uh, you know, conference from them. That's where we learn more about what's coming next in office and other uh, things like their mixed reality stuff. So we're going to be talking about a lot of that stuff for next week. Um, but yeah, Sherlyn, what is up with you? <laughs> um, so this week has been mostly like, you know, hitting the news that keep coming. And uh, my ThinkPad X1 Nano review finally went up so you can go check it out. Uh, long story short, it's a very light ThinkPad. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm also getting in some pretty quirky products and devices. Mm. Uh, those of you who enjoyed the mask phone little hands-on that I did a while back will uh -huh. enjoy what I've got coming up for you. Uh, but these are definitely under embargo. Well, some of them are under embargo, and I shall not say I would like to surprise y'all, but Come back next week. There will be there will be fun stuff to see, um, and then 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 some other stuff I still can't talk about. <laughs> so oh, lots exciting. of exciting. Okay, All right, pause here. A little pause, to, uh, Ben. Uh, yeah, that's enough of a pause. We can move on. Okay. okay. Oh, you just need a pause. Oh yeah, not like a Q &A. Yeah. No, no, not a Q and A. Just like a little pause. Gotcha. <laughs> okay, cool. Dev, do you want to lead picks? I could do. Yeah. Okay. Cool. But I will throw it to you first. Yeah. Let's move on to our pop culture picks. Um, Sherlyn, what do you have in store for us this week? So this week, I blame Valentina, our <laughs> for the YouTube hole I found myself in. All of this week, most of this week, I found myself catching up on YouTube tea, YouTube drama. And uh, <laughs> it was... I used to pay attention to beauty YouTube. So it would be like um, the whole Tati Westbrook, James Charles and Jeffree Star and Shane Dawson con uh, controversy. I, I'm but, nodding. Yes, I know these names. Uh -huh. You know this okay. very good. No, 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 oh. no. Uh, <laughs> I was surprised. Please say but, more names. Um, but the way I managed to catch up with uh, some of this stuff uh, is through a YouTuber called D'Angelo Wallace. D'Angelo Wallace is a uh, commentary YouTuber, and he is just really cogent and mm -hmm. so thoughtful about the videos he's put together. He has uh, two styles of videos. One are these 10-minute explainer-style videos. And really, the very first video of his I watched that Valentina uh, introduced me to was his 10-minute sort of explainer of the Hilaria Baldwin incident. That's AKA okay. the Hilaria Baldwin incident. Um, you and, need to explain what that incident is because I think it is one of the wildest uh, uh, stories of insane so celebrity hard. culture I've seen ever. Yeah. Totally. So Il Hilaria Baldwin or Hilaria Baldwin. I don't even. Hilaria. <laughs> We're going to say Hilaria from here on. Uh -huh. Hilaria Baldwin 
originally Hil- Hillary Thomas, is most well known for being wife of Alec Baldwin. Sure. And uh, yet, there somehow she she was born in Boston, uh-huh. grew up there more or less, but somehow managed decided halfway through that I love Spain. I'm going to say I'm born in Mallorca, Spain. Her family and, spends a lot of time in Spain, so that is her connection there. Apparently, yeah. that that's what she says. But then yeah. you'll see multiple video clips of her saying she has 35 to 40 family members from Spain yeah, and she yeah. grew up in Spain sl- and mm. then she backpedaled and said she was spent some time or spent a lot of time in Spain she went from saying her parents used to, like lived in Spain to yeah. visit Spain and like because the internet did what it did best <laughs> which is yeah. to debunk every one of those things so anyway if you want a good catch up on that little piece of internet drama the Angela Wallace's video is actually really cool. good. Well, no, the um, drama is that she pretended she was somebody with like a Spanish accent ex- in a way that helped her sell her crappy food recipes and even... stuff better. Like it is talk about appropriation. Like, yeah, she fully, yeah. fully as an immigrant, it hurt me yep, to, yep. to see this because as an immigrant who struggles with her own accent to see someone adopt an accent and that that people who usually try to hide exactly um, yeah. it, it was very insulting and uh she basically sometimes puts adopts a more spanish sounding accent yep. and, and uh, forgets english words for common food items like cucumber but she knows as a girl from boston or boston area yeah yeah, yeah. also Cucumber is a very common vegetable. It's not <laughs> like me and me and like Valentina were talking about this. We're like, it's not like it's an eggplant where there's three different what's words, this, three different what's languages. word cucumber. Oh, cucumber. Okay. This is there's cucumber. no different word in a different like anyway. anyway. But like, Angela <laughs> Wallace breaks it down. <laughs> the Angela Wallace also like that's that's one style. The 10 minute video. He also had a 10 minute video on Soho Karen. Y'all should catch up on that too. Um, okay. Okay. Soho Karen is the girl who lost her phone, thought it was a oh yes, yes, okay boy yep. in a hotel in Soho, New York, and tackled him. Yep. Uh, but actually, she had left it in an Uber. Yeah, um. But but the videos that I did get sucked into were the James Char- the beauty YouTube community drama from last year and the year before that maybe. Um. And uh, he did hour long videos kind of explaining why each of these personalities is flawed and and unearths some really good information and presents Mm -hmm. very convincing cases. Uh, D'Angelo Wallace himself won a Streamy fairly recently for being one of the best commentary YouTubers, or actually was nominated for a Streamy, my bad. Um, But just his videos are so well-produced, so high quality, so well-researched, and just put together... You can see so much time and effort went into them. The animations are great. The editing is great. His commentary is great. So mm-hmm. I respect the hell out of this. <laughs> this person. Um, so that's my pick. The other thing I did watch uh, this week was the uh, crime, this Netflix docu series called Crime Scene, The Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel. Oh, yeah. Did oh, you see boy. that one? I've been, I mean, this is a story I've, known about for a while so to have a whole series devoted to like this creepy hotel this was the one where the girl they found a girl who was in the water tower and she was there for a while and people were drinking the water and like mm. so this is about the disappearance of elisa lamb Mm -hmm. uh the case at least that we were talking about uh and i i was very drawn to it a because she's an asian girl and i'm an asian girl and i was like oh no i could end up in the water tank but um (laughs) B the the series though focuses on this hotel and like all of the things that have happened there. Yeah, Richard yeah. Ramirez stayed there while he was the night stalker. I think that was his criminal name. I, I it could be something. Else. He, I forget who. Yeah, which one? He he could be the night stalker or the one of the many other criminal names. Anyway, Richard Ramirez stayed there during his tenure as a killer, as a serial killer. Um, there have been multiple suicides. It's just a very troubled hotel with a strange history. The Elise- this is one in like downtown LA, right? Which is, yeah. it's a, there's some weird stuff there because it's like yeah, a hip area right. at certain times, but also like, yeah, it, it's Skid Row. And it's also like, you can clearly see the dichotomy between very rich LA and very poor LA. And this hotel is just like situated amidst all of that. Um, I had some friends who I think, 
tried to stay there for E3 or something um, one year. And they were like, I don't want to be in this building. We got to go somewhere else. So it's like, it is one of those like heavy places where a lot of crap has gone down apparently. Uh, yeah. So the Netflix documentary does a fairly good, good job of chasing down all of these different tangents, I want to say. Uh-huh. So some of the reviews for it are like saying that it's bloated and, and that sort of thing, which come on, it's kind of a pun. Um, but mm. I... <laughs> a painful mm. one. I, mm. I personally yikes like it's uh it's a bit it's a bit there's a lot there's a lot I, there are some parts of the documentary that i don't feel very comfortable watching especially when yeah. they uh talk about how the web sleuths came together to look for elisa lamb and and yeah. the web sleuths did end up ruining someone else's life and the documentary makes that fairly clear web but sleuths. I, yeah I, know, I got very annoyed by that um but all in all if you like mm-hmm. crying Docu series, it's an it's a it's an intriguing one with a lot of different tangents. Yeah. You could know. I've seen a bunch of this, by the way, and uh, I like the they do focus on like the mental health aspect. Where mm-hmm. I think part of it was, um, you know, the person who was in the water tower, like she yeah. was bipolar, she had issues, and maybe there was a certain responsibility from the hotel to take care of her in a way, like just at least acknowledge the fact that she is going through something. And it seems like the hotel just didn't. So yeah, there there's a lot of stuff going on here. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. There there's this is this was an intriguing case. It was a very interesting case. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah. uh watch the sto- watch this docu series to to see all about it. I think it's it does try to hit a lot of things, maybe too much, but it's engaging. Okay. Uh, I wanted to bring up a movie I saw on Hulu. It's something I've been looking forward to for a long time, and I think you'd really like it too, Sherlyn. Uh, it's by Chloe Zhao, who is a Chinese-American director. She did The Writer a couple of years ago, and this is a movie called Nomadland. Um, it's about a woman played by Frances McDormand who loses everything after the Great Recession. Her husband passes away. She doesn't really have a job. Um, she gives everything up. She kind of sells whatever she does have to buy a van and live out of that van. It's about the community of people in America who choose to live like nomads, to travel around the country, to live in their either vans or RVs or whatever they whatever they have, uh, you know, gather at campgrounds, kind of form their own community um, of people who it seems like society has kind of let down in a way. And uh, it's a tremendous movie. I love this movie a lot um, because it does really focus on something I'd say is like the ultimate failure of America, right? Like the, I think the immigrant story, you know, the story my parents believed when they came to this country was like, yeah, America's a land of possibility. It's a land of success. You work hard, you could get whatever, you know, whatever you deserve here. But Nomadland is like the story of people who did a lot of that work you know people who worked at company towns they you know devote themselves to a single company and the thing with the story is that she uh, her character uh fern worked um and lived at a place that was basically a company town when the company went bankrupt the town just disappeared you know the town's just gone because there's mm-hmm. nothing else to support it so it wasn't like uh even like a legitimate uh or like a city built up by a civil government or something so she has no money. She has to go to Amazon, you know, shipping, you know, shipping factories to kind of get some work. Mm-hmm. She gets work doing all sorts of things. It is about the struggle that a lot of people are facing in America, especially if you're older, you don't have retirement savings, um, you know, and the pressure of living a life in America is like, well, you got to have a house. You got to have, you know, a decent job. You have to have stuff. And this is a movie that's all about like what happens when you give up on that stuff in a way and kind of break free from the constraints of society. So it is a very, it's a feature, you know, it's a narrative feature, but it's also like semi-documentary because uh, Chloe Zhao brings in people from this nomad community who talk about their own lives and their own experiences and like add a layer of authenticity to the movie. Um, So yeah, it's a beautiful film. I highly recommend checking it out. Also check out The Writer, which is a movie she did about um, a Native American uh, rodeo rider who is coming to terms with the fact that if he could ride or not and that was played by n- non-actors amateurs but people who lived in that community i love her mm-hmm. movies because there's always like a li- there it's all about realism and authenticity almost semi-documentary like but also with a narrative that she wraps around it chloe Zhao like is on a on a roll right now because she's actually working on a marvel movie she's doing immortals Dang. which is the one um 
what's his face got beefed up for um so or no hmm? who got beefed up for Thor? Not Thor, the comedian comedian whose name is escaping me right now from silicon valley oh um Silicon Valley. I, I know who you're talking about. Ah, yeah, I know yeah. exactly who you're talking about too. Uh, Kumail. Kumail Nanjiani. I'm Kumail trying to Nanjiani, think like, yeah. which Indian comedian is he? Which is the other <laughs> thing. Kumail uh, but Kumail, who I love, um, I think is great, but he got super beefed up for this movie. I do wonder how like her sensibilities as like an artist, as somebody who cre- creates these like really realistic dramas uh, is going to adapt to immortals, you know, or like a Marvel Cinematic Universe thing uh it'll be really interesting but i think you should check it out also because you know shout out to somebody an immigrant into this country who is telling stories about america in ways i think few american directors actually are it's she has such a great lens into this country so i'd highly recommend nomad land it's on hulu right now i want to really quickly correct what we said kumau nanjani there's three yep, syllables yep. to that name yep, yep. <laughs> but, yes. go for it uh, and I'll let you wrap up, Shalin. Yeah, yeah, wrap it up. But right. actually, to everyone watching the stream, let's remember uh, we're wrapping up the podcast recording. We're recording things out of order. So if you're here for... Just stick around Mars for the Mars stuff, talk. Please stick yeah. around. We're going to have our um, Mars expert. We'll have a bit of a and- chat. Is it astrophysicist or astro? Is she an astrophysicist astrologist. or is no, not not well, astrologist? Really. <laughs> that is the bad thing. No, no, oh. astrologist may actually be a science. Astrologer yeah. is um, okay. I, there you go. I She's a PhD candidate, is what we're going to say. But that is going to be Sophia focusing Gav- on cosmology Nasser. and yeah. astroparticle theory. Okay, yes. So she's a cosmologist. So yes, even though you hear us wrapping up the recording of the show, it's really just for the audio podcast. Please stick around. We're going to be talking about space in not too long at all. Mm -hmm. All right, ready? Yep. And that's it for our episode this week, everyone. Thank you, as always, for listening. Our theme music is by game composer Dale North. Our outro music is by our very own Terrence O'Brien. The podcast is produced by Ben Elman. You can find Devendra online at... At Devendra on Twitter. And uh, I talk about movies and TV at the Slash Filmcast at SlashFilm.com. If you want to send me tips about the hottest tea around YouTube, you can hit me <laughs> up on Twitter at Sherlyn Lowe. Email us your thoughts and feedback at podcast at Engadget.com. Leave us a review, please, on iTunes. And subscribe on anything that gets podcasts, including Spotify. Woo! Okay. Let's right. uh, let's plan to plan to break from the live stream at like eleven twenty five. How about that to give okay, sure. uh, Sophia some time to come in? I'll yeah. let you guys kickstart the Q and I'm just going to run to the back sure. and get some more water. So okay, sure. what that means, uh, live stream folks, is that we'll just start playing some video cover um, around eleven twenty five. That's in about ten nine minutes. Uh, so we'll still see your chat. We'll still be around. We'll still answer questions at the end of the entire stream, but. Uh, yeah, this is just, just to just make so sure you know. that like uh, everything is good with our guests. We can do all of the technical stuff, and mm-hmm. it would be better to figure out all of that technical stuff behind a proverbial curtain, and then come out and be all ready to um, just talk about uh, the Mars rover and stuff. I'm looking forward to it because we actually have the Mars rover tech specs, and we're going to be talking about the specs just as if it were any other piece of tech, like a phone or a laptop. Uh, so in terms of <laughs> the chat, uh, a lot of what I, <laughs> what I saw in the chat was uh, that we were talking about Star Trek, which is so stereotypic. I, I mean, sure. I, I think it just came up because someone asked if, if people like Trek, uh, anyone Star Trek fans, Raj Luthor asked, and then heard news about the series. I haven't heard any news. I'm not really a a um, star or Trekkie, I guess. Um, but apparently, there's some news about a new series, and Quentin Tarantino might be directing. I'm not entirely sure. Excuse me. I don't know. That's that's what it looks like. The chat was saying Cornell asked if Quentin Tarantino is directing. I think oh, I don't know. Yeah. I I think that that's very likely not correct. But um, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> And so continuing on the chat, uh, there is indeed a lot of Trek talk, which is very fine. I love that y'all are talking with each other about it. 
Um, but I think I saw something from was it Daniel Kakane that was a question I wanted to answer. I see. I cannot remember. I see a similar thing. I mean, also from Daniel saying, uh, talking about the uh, ROG flow, or is it ROG, Republic of Gamers? ROG or ROG, both work. Yeah. Flow X13. I ROG would be a gaming device, so I'm not super on top of the gaming uh, hardware. So we can wait till Dev gets back to see what that is. Um, analog is also another probably older device type name. Yeah. Disenchantment. So... Dman7895 talks about Disenchantment. Disenchantment has been on my list for a long time. I've been talking about, I've been interested in watching it. And then, um, actually, I think all of this stuff we are talking about Star Trek was happening while uh, we were talking about like AI and stuff. I think it's kind of hard to talk about AI just because of how complicated it is. And it's only going to get more complicated because it seems like we're designing this stuff for um, like our conventional binary computers. And then, holy crap, what are we going to be able to do once um, we can scale that up onto quantum computers? Like, that's when we get into the world of devs. Uh, you know that wasn't yes. was devs coming out with like was that uh airing like just about this time last year or was it like at the very end of 2019 or something i remember like it was a very bleak show and it was also a bleak time so i did not want to watch the bleak show yeah, i think it was bleak time potentially around this time i can't remember either but i i, I... I don't remember being out and about talking about devs. Time is an illusion. Helps. The one of the big things that uh, this extended period of quarantine has shown us is that time is an illusion. Yeah, Cornell asked. He's Pakistani, though, right? I think you're talking about Kumail Nanjani, and mm -hmm. yeah, he's Pakistani American. According mm, to, mm, I don't. I mean, he was born in Pakistan. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. I think he yeah. only actually came to born in US. Karachi, nineteen seventy eight. Yeah. According yeah, I think to he man. only came to. He came the for US college for college. Yeah, mm, actually. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was a uh, serious turnaround for his life. I think I remember hearing an interview with him about that, and he was mm -hmm. like, "Yes, I was doing." Um, like my uh, college studies in, I think it was some variation of engineering, mm -hmm. but like he was also consuming like American comedy <laughs> the way anyone else who works in comedy was, you know, watching old uh, versions of the Johnny Carson show and stuff like that. Um, it's a interesting dual life. All right. Uh, do people in the chat, I, I, you know, love the chat as always, but I don't see any like explicit Emma, questions. Ask us anything. Yeah. This is, yeah, this is, you got like close to five minutes to ask literally anything <laughs> you want. So, uh, yeah. Go we for it. Go for it. How are, how are things in New York? I'm wondering because I feel a little <laughs> guilty. It is, uh, it is like gorgeous and sunny and 70 degrees right now. Oh, so. it's yeah, super no, warm no. today. It's good, like almost good. 50 degrees today. Well, <laughs> yes, <laughs> almost 50. I saw something on Twitter just yesterday that was, you know, someone from uh, like New York area, East Coast saying mm -hmm. like, okay, yeah, like the West Coast and the South is like warm all the time or like. Not all the time, but But, yeah. but like Depends Southern California. Yes. Um, like, okay, yeah, it might be warm all the time, but like you can't even uh, touch the feeling of like when 50 feels like 80 yeah, after it's yeah. been like only 25 degrees for the last I love variation. Like two and a half weeks or three weeks. Yeah. And then someone from the West Coast, someone from like Southern California, LA area was like 50 and 80. Like what, what does this mean? Are those freeways? <laughs> Okay, we have two questions. One, mm -hmm. Mark Dell, uh, Dev, when you were gone, uh, yep. someone was asking about the ROG Flow X13. Did yes. you even I know need about to, that? I mean, we've rewrote up the news, so we know it exists, yeah. but uh, Asus yeah. has not given that to us for review yet. Hopefully, that'll be mm -hmm. coming soon. I'd like to play with it. Gotcha. Uh, Daniel Cockane asks, when am I, in, or are we, installing the Android 12 beta? I'm not <laughs> installing the developer preview because... <laughs> 
not meant for me. It's not meant for. Don't you have you have uh, like reviewers. yummy devices you could just throw it onto? Though, I have right? several. Yeah, but it's a manual install only. You have to flash an image to the ROM and all of that stuff. So oh, yeah. I thought you were an Android expert, Sherlyn. Hmm. Oh, I could be, but I'm not going to like <laughs> waste time testing a developer preview for non-work purposes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I'm also not working on an app trying to make it compatible for Android 12 just yet. So. <laughs> Raj Luther asks, how good are foldable smartphones? I am thinking of buying one. Ah, uh, they're getting better. But which to, depends really on which one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, and really your only good option right now is Samsung's. So uh, you'll see a lot of people really enjoy them. Um, I know Mr. Mobile, uh, Michael Fisher does. He really loves his foldable phones. And they're actually good enough now to use as daily drivers. Uh, Sam Rutherford from Gizmodo also loves his uh, foldable phone. I mean, our very own Chris Velasco has bought one, right? So, you know. Yeah, yeah. Chris Velasco also went out and bought his own. And so, yeah, I mean. <laughs> well, yeah, but we're also talking about, or I think you're talking about what's available specifically in the U.S. What if, yeah. like, what about international markets? Do you know anything about, like, there is the the Huawei one, but for reasons we, I think, talked about earlier already, I, I'm not going to be able to recommend a Huawei device to yep. anyone at the moment for several reasons. The Uyghur treat, the involvement with Chinese government or the Uyghur concentration camps or whatever, um, and the uh, lack of Google app access is a huge functional one that you might miss. Um, so there's those... Uh, there are other there are other foldable phones either already <laughs> launched or in the works. For example, Moto with the Razer, mm -hmm. TCL has promised one of its many many concept devices will be coming I, out soon. Charlene, in good conscience, can you recommend a foldable to anybody? Because it does the value of what you're getting, right? Other than, huh, my phone does this. Yeah, it's amazing, and I'm spending fifteen hundred or more it for that. Feels like billionaire. It goes this. It goes like yeah. this. Yeah. yeah. Let's put it this way. I Would I buy a foldable phone? No, I wouldn't because I don't see enough uses for it yet. But right. there are people who want it for the novelty, who want it for the... For those people, if you have very specific needs or desires, you can because the Samsung one is actually good enough to use. Like I won't... Sure, sure. It won't die on you. It won't like... It's not completely unusable. Uh... It's fine. Um, like the Surface Duo, I barely can even recommend because it was just mm -hmm. finicky as hell. But the Galaxy Z Fold, the Galaxy Z Fold Two, is at least workable. It's good enough that there are people actually going out to buy it that I know, and they spend, actually enjoy it in the wild. Yeah. If you could spend over two thousand dollars on a phone, right? What was the if you have price the money? Like? Yeah, there was actually more like sixteen hundred. I'm not going to guess. Okay. Let me let me okay. pull it up. So just like a yeah, little like more than a flagship thing. premium. So right, it's not that much more. It used to be to closer to twice the price. Yes. Yes. Um. It's more like $1,450 uh, for the Z Fold 2 5G. Mm -hmm. So $1,450. Um, and then if you can get it with sales, it could come down to as low as, I don't know, $1,300. Um, <laughs> as low as, hey. I'd love okay. to spend time playing with one. But man, it is one of those things where it's like, are, do you want to buy a device that's going to last you two or three years? Like, I don't, we don't know if the mechanics of these things will last. Like, there's a lot we don't know. What we do know yeah. is you build a flat slab of glass uh you can actually build a phone that'll last a while you know with decent hardware these days so hey it's all gamble it's all gamble anyhow it's uh -huh. like 11 27 i think yeah, we let's, should, uh, um we're gonna take a break Sophia. Yeah. we're gonna bring on our guest uh, and we're gonna throw up a video right now uh that talks about how some of the people who worked on the mars rover kind of got into that business and uh, if we have a little more time there's also some uh, a video about sherlin's latest video uh of that uh lenovo pad x1 nano think pad x1 nano so check that out we'll be right back folks after a thankfully uneventful seven month journey nasa's mars 2020 mission safely reached the red planet and inserted itself into orbit on Thursday, ahead of deploying the Perseverance rover, an Ingenuity helicopter prototype, down to the planet's surface in search of evidence of ancient microbial life. However, this expedition has been in the works for far longer than Perseverance has been traveling through interplanetary space. First announced in 2012, this mission marks the culmination of nearly a decade's worth of work by hundreds of machinists and designers, rocket scientists, and engineers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory.
But not just anyone can get hired there. Working for the world's premier spacecraft production facility and building equipment that will grace the surfaces of neighboring planets. For Muhammad Abid, a deputy chief mechanical engineer on the Mars 2020 mission, the path to working at the JPL began in his native Tunisia. After graduating high school there, Abid moved to the UK to complete his master's before coming to the US for his PhD. But good grades weren't the only thing that helped him get his foot in the door at the JPL. Abid credits having multiple internships under his belt as a key factor in his getting hired. Internships gave me what I needed to get where I am, he told Engadget. Abid also advocates for potential JPL applicants to develop and nurture their hobbies, whether that's puttering around the garage while homebrewing robots, learning about ethical hacking, or even just painting and other traditional arts. That added hands-on experience could well be the extra nudge needed to convince recruiters to hire you versus an otherwise equally qualified candidate. These additional qualifications can also help newly hired JPL employees rise through the agency's ranks. While these experiences can help set you apart from the rest of the applicant pool, you will still need to pass your interview, which Abid notes is very attribute dependent. Some interviewers will ask difficult questions akin to Google's infamous how many golf balls fit on a school bus while others will focus more on the applicant's critical thinking skills or interpersonal capabilities. As Deputy Chief Mechanical Engineer, Abid's responsibilities at the JPL are quite varied as well, depending on the phase that the project is currently in. For the design phase, his focus is to ask, do you have the right designs? Is this the right design for us to use? What are the trades that we need to have in place, and what decisions have to be made to go with one design versus another? Once the project enters the build phase, Abid must worry about, are we building the right thing? What are the materials that we're using? What are the analyses that we're using? Basically making sure that the team is asking the right questions and ensuring that they, as he put it, come up with the right system that can meet the requirements and constraints that we have for this super duper complicated machinery. The testing and verification phase is especially exciting for Abid as he has afforded the opportunity to troubleshoot problems ranging from ensuring that the adhesives used to glue components together bond tightly enough to confirming that critical systems won't rattle themselves to pieces under the strains of launch. For Christina Hernandez, a payload systems engineer at the JPL, her position is all about asking why. We're kind of like a jack of all trades, she explained to Engadget. Our job is to be in it. A payload systems engineer is basically the person whose job it is to understand the science instruments and the tools aboard the Perseverance rover. Hernandez's route to the JPL was a bit more direct than the beats. She graduated from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo with a master's in spacecraft design and space environments modeling initially interested in creating systems to collect space junk from low Earth orbit. She found that problem fascinating, so she went ahead and learned basic programming skills that she'd need, like Fortran. But more importantly, she developed her critical thinking skills. Hernandez notes, a systems engineer has to be able to question all of the disciplines that it takes to come up with whatever particular design is being implemented. Now, not every position within the JPL requires such a breadth and depth of knowledge. While some employees will move between roles and teams multiple times during their careers, others will find their niche and stick with it, such as fastener specialists who, as the title implies, focus all of their efforts solely on rover fasteners and only that during their time at the JPL. For Hernandez, the most intriguing part of the Mars 2020 production cycle has been the verification and validation phase. That's due in part to the fact that the JPL test site that they use is home to Optimism, a nearly identical twin to the Perseverance rover, as well as one for the Ingenuity helicopter. These allow PSEs to see how the hardware and software systems interact in a Mars-like environment in real time. As she explains, that's where you know all the systems engineers get excited because you kind of start to get a feel for whether the end-to-end -end system is going in the direction that you envisioned based off your scientific and mission objectives. The Mars 2020 mission is expected to arrive at its destination on Thursday, February 18th at around 3.55 p.m. Eastern. Tune into NASA's YouTube channel to watch the orbital insertion live. Lenovo's ThinkPad series has a loyal fan base, and mostly for good reason. The laptops usually offer reliable performance, excellent keyboards, and long-lasting batteries that make them great, well-rounded machines. The company also improved its displays lately and attempted to refresh its classic, almost staid design to keep the ThinkPads looking modern while maintaining a distinct look. The X1 Nano is Lenovo's lightest ThinkPad yet, and it's one of the company's first to meet Intel's Evo certification for compact, lightweight, and powerful laptops. 
For $13.99, the Nano offers a 16x10 display, a physical webcam shutter, and a new 11th gen Intel processor. But really, the most outstanding feature is that it weighs less than 2 pounds. The question here then is, did Lenovo have to sacrifice anything to make the Nano so light? On the surface, at least, it doesn't seem as if Lenovo had to cut corners on build quality. The Nano looks nearly identical to the X1 Carbon that I reviewed in 2019 and feels nearly as light. But of course, I'm not a weighing scale, in case you weren't aware. According to Lenovo, though, the X1 Carbon 2019 is 2.4 pounds, while the Nano comes in at 1.99 pounds. Meanwhile, the latest Dell XPS 13 measures 2.64 pounds, while the MacBook Air M1 and the latest HP Spectre X360 13 both weigh 2.8 pounds. Even Samsung's super thin Galaxy Book Flex is heavier at 2.54 pounds. Despite being so light, the Nano is surprisingly sturdy and exhibited little flex, making it easy to hold and use with one hand as I walked around my apartment multitasking. Like all ThinkPads, this machine meets military spec standards for durability, so it can survive some rough handling. I also like the matte finish here, which is clean looking for now, although based on the X1 Carbon that I've had around for almost two years, this won't remain pristine forever. There are two USB-C Thunderbolt 4 slots and a headphone jack on the left edge and a power button on the right. That's it. If you need more connections, you'll want to invest in a dongle. I do wish Lenovo had placed the power button on the keyboard deck where it would be easier to access, but that's a small gripe. What the Nano does have on its keyboard deck is a small fingerprint sensor next to the trackpad, which offers an alternative biometric login in addition to face recognition above the display. I like that Lenovo included a physical shutter for the webcam here too. None of these biometric login options, by the way, are new to the ThinkPad series. It's just nice to know that the company didn't sacrifice any of these things to make the Nano lighter. One thing that is new with the Nano is its 16 by 10 aspect ratio. That means that its 13 inch display is taller than older ThinkPads and lets you see more at once. I love it. Honestly, all laptops should go 16 by 10. You can see more emails, spreadsheet rows, tweets, or memes on your screen at once. It's just better. It's worth noting though that Lenovo is somewhat late to this, since Dell and Apple have used this aspect ratio for a while now. HP's latest Spectre X360 13 is still stuck on 16 by 9 though. Aside from the... So let's talk about the Mars Perseverance rover which just landed this week. And to chat about that, we've brought on a tremendous... Uh, to chat about that, we brought on a tremendous guest, somebody whose videos I've been watching for a while now uh, on TikTok and all over. Uh, we have PhD candidate Sophia Gad Nasser. How are you doing, Sophia? I'm doing great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And, um, you know, let's just say up front, um, who are you? What do you do? I, I think you're a very good presenter of scientific information, but how do you approach your, you know, what are you working on on the internet these days? Oh, so on the internet, I do um, a lot of science communication and uh, anywhere spaces. I'm pretty, <laughs> I'm pretty much there just because I love this stuff so much. But um, in my work, I work on like the really sort of spooky side of the universe. I work on dark matter. <laughs> fun. Okay. All right. And I know you've been a scientific, you've been a science advisor to some shows, right? Like 12 Monkeys? Yes, I have. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, your work is out there. So my first question for you um, is, uh, what can you tell us what is so important about the Mars Perseverance rover and this mission overall? Because uh, we just had the, the Curiosity rover landed almost a decade ago now. Um, what is special about this and how is it different from Curiosity? Yeah, so this is a this is an important question, I think. And it's a, it's a question that a lot of people have because we have just, as you said, landed um, not too long ago another rover on Mars um, and every rover landing that we have is a huge feat in my yeah. view, because it's really hard to do this stuff. But with perseverance, I, I call it like a mission of the future because it has experiments on, on it that are preparing Mars for humans <laughs> to come. So it's preparing for astronauts to land on the planet. And so mm -hmm. that's why I call it a mission of the future. And that's why it's so important. And it's also going to look for, signs of past life on Mars as well. So it's a really, really big mission. It'll be um, holding on so onto soil for like a future mission to come and pick up. It's all like, it's very, it's very much tied into like future missions and the future of space exploration. 
For sure. You brought up some cool things. Uh, I believe you did like a great TikTok, just like highlighting some of the great elements of this mission. Can you expand that on that a little? Like it's, it's going to be involved in oxygen production, sort of, right? For the future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, so so it has a whole bunch of different like experiments on it, but one is called Moxie, um, and that's and that's it's like the Mars Oxygen uh, I S R U experiment. <laughs> but this, but it's essentially it's a, it's an experiment that's going to be on Mars, um, taking the carbon dioxide in the air and converting it into oxygen. And what this what this experiment is essentially doing is seeing how or whether, whether it's feasible to do this so that in the future, if they, if, mm. if it works out, then they would actually send something more, um, you know, I guess a, a larger scale thing that would prepare for humans. Gotcha. Yeah. It is a very forward facing mission, it seems to. And you mentioned like, it's going to be collecting samples. Um, how is that different from curiosity? Cause I know, or I know like curiosity also sampled some soil and sent that information back too, but I guess this one is going to be holding on to it. How is that special, I guess? And how will that help future astronauts? Well, um, it's, 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 it's going to help. It's not, it's not necessarily just the just future astronauts, but like just for us, we're actually going to get like our first samples mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. Mars, like, an, you know, directly from the planet. And so um, the difference between this mission and, and the other one is that this is actually holding on to these samples uh -huh. and waiting for a future mission to come and pick them up, bring them back to Earth. Yeah, and that's going to be yeah. a much bigger job right now, right? I feel like every every rover launch right now, we've had a couple, um, you know, uh, satellites from other countries kind of make their way to Mars orbit. Uh, just doing that is difficult enough, but those the future missions you're talking about would also have to land and lift off from the planet and come back? What is the, how far away are we from a mission like that? Like 10 years, 15 years? Well, um, just for just for the, the mission that would bring back the samples alone, that we're waiting, we're, we're looking at earliest 20, uh, 2031, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so to see, it's at least 10 years minimum. Wow, wow, okay. But I think one thing I really want to dive into here too is the uh, the landing process of uh, of the Perseverance rover, and uh, I think it's worth doing. Um, NASA released a three and a half minute video of the entire landing sequence, um, starting from space, starting with the heat shield going down. Let's take a look at that, and uh, why don't we talk over it a little, like a game stream, because I think uh, there, there's so much to call out here. And Sophia, feel free to like, if you see anything notable, if there's anything you want our audience to know, because we're seeing the parachute deploy right now in our video stream. Talk us through this a little, please. Okay, so um, we've passed one of the, one of the uh, most, I guess, the scariest parts, which is atmospheric entry, because yes. during atmospheric yes. entry, you get like huge heating, and of course, uh, perseverance is encased in this in this uh, in sort of like a protection shield. It has a heat mm -hmm. shield that will protect it from from that. Um, but there's also like at this point, we're at a parachute deployment, and this is a supersonic yeah. parachute, so it has to deploy faster than the speed of sound. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's. <laughs> I have to bring that up because that's, that's really pretty cool. wild. I also love the the shot of the heat shield falling into Mars. Just seems like it is breathtaking to me. It is all. It reminds me of like the shot that you see whenever a rocket lifts off from Earth, and you see like the booster kind of fall back a little into Earth. Like it is exactly that, except it's completely different too, right? Yes, exactly. And so like, and yet, right. So it drops off the heat shield, um, yeah. so that it you know so that it can have like it has less weight, and then it kind of can more guide itself and then at this point it starts turning on things like the rate it has it has a radar on it mm -hmm. where that radar is going to help it sort of figure out where where it is at that point so that it can land um but then this 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 tech this new technology kicks in it's called um the terrain relative navigation and so um this this technology essentially what it's what it's going to do is scan the land that it's that, that is around it and then take that match it to a map that it has on board so it can figure out where it is and then that way it kind of sees where it's going and so um <laughs> i think at this point I, I don't know um yeah okay so we're, we're, we're still we're still kind of hanging on and waiting because eventually there's going to be we like see the gusts of air too right that it looks like the the 
rover is blasting out to kind of just well help that's the, the thing itself. above it right the the mechanism that's actually helping to slow it down because i believe right there isn't enough air drag for the parachute to do enough to slow it down right exactly and so it has to turn on its little little rockets that are on this um this sort of a back shell thing that it has and so these little rockets are what it's what it has to has to use to guide it and then once the back shell is is sort of gone it has this uh it has like a, a um uh, what's it called? Yeah, so so it's, it'll it'll have these. It's on the descent stage. Sorry, mm -hmm, so on the mm -hmm. descent stage, it has eight rockets, and that's yeah. that's what we're seeing, kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, causing the the soil yeah. to go all yeah. And so that's what it has to use in order to in order to have a safe landing, because as you said, there's no drag, <laughs> and the parachute obviously wasn't going to help in the in the atmosphere. <laughs> the atmosphere is only one percent of Earth, and so yeah. So this is like oh, and there's the sky crane. So the sky crane. <laughs> Basically, that's it, that's its whole. That's that's everything. It's done. Like so, the sky crane has done its job. Its job is literally to get Mars down or to get Perseverance down to Mars safely, and then it just flies off. Okay, <laughs> and I think I think the sky crane this time landed like seven hundred meters away from Perseverance and crashed. That's amazing. Out. There is some fan fiction to be written about that poor sky crane. It's like I did <laughs> yes. my job. Time to die. Time to just go sit in Mars. Maybe somebody will rescue me eventually. Have we? Where are the memes? Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, did the did the Curiosity rover did it have a similar landing setup? Because I feel like this is a little different, almost, right? Yeah, it is. Um, you know, and, and it has also new technology and stuff like that. And yeah. Uh, but yeah, so but it's but it's but it's really similar. The the landings for for Curiosity and um, and Perseverance are very similar. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, one thing we noticed too, uh, there was like a bit of a puzzle that NASA kind of hinted at uh, as the parachute was deploying and uh, people on the internet immediately got to it and they noticed like there are all these markings around the parachute. Uh, mm -hmm. The nerds immediately saw it was like, this is binary code. And um, it only took a couple hours for someone to decode it. And apparently it says, dare mighty things uh, in the concentric circles and also has the location of the NASA, uh, one of the NASA visitor centers, I believe, right? And what what is the significance of this, Sophia? Because I know it's a phrase we come back to quite a bit with every NASA mission, right? It's at the heart of the uh, organization. Yeah, so <clears throat> dare mighty things, it's NASA's motto. And so um, I know NASA, NASA loves to send these yeah. like Easter eggs with missions. And this was one of them, there's more to come, mind you. So there are more to come. We don't. We haven't seen them all yet. <laughs> and so, so keep your eyes open for that. Uh, I know people will be sitting there waiting to try to decode them. If, if it's if it's a code, for example, or if it's something like this where we didn't, you know, we didn't understand what it was, we had to like decode it and stuff. I thought I thought it was great. Like it was what six hours later, somebody yeah, came up with yeah. the, with the solution. It was just like that. Dare mighty things. It's the motto of NASA. And then they had like the coordinates on it too um <laughs> and dare mighty things is so fitting because every mission that they send out into space is mighty it's like mm -hmm. they are daring the mightiest of things yeah. <laughs> it's to... sort of like it's an immediate yeah. rebook too to everybody who's like why are we spending money on mars it's like we have enough problems on earth and it just seems like <laughs> uh so this motto uh cnn points out it borrows from the theodore roosevelt quote Far better is it to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy nor suffer much because they live in a gray twilight that knows not victory nor defeat. Uh, damn, that's a bit of a slam, I think, to the, uh, the negative naysayers, but it really strikes to the heart of what NASA tries to do, right? Just trying to make us think of a better, bigger future with these missions. Yes, and I mean... I think a lot of people that say things like, like, you know, that we're wasting money on space missions probably don't really know how much money space exploration gets in the first place. Sure, uh, sure. Okay. Cause it, in 2020, it got 0.48% of the entire government's budget. So we got less than half a percent of it. Mm -hmm. Not much, definitely not the, the thing that you want to go and attack, but Another thing I think people don't realize is that just because we're sending something, it's because we're sending something out so far, they don't see how the how the benefits can be tangible to us. Right. It's just, it's just right. so removed from us. But space exploration and bettering our 
our, um, you know, our space flight, our equipment and all that stuff, bettering that stuff has actually brought us so many practical advances. Like you use these practical advances every day. Um, if you, if you, if you're a TikToker, for example, or you, or you're happy to, you know, happily can connect with people using like your video, your phone camera. I think one third of, of everybody's phone cameras are still the ones that came from, um, that came from space flight. And so, medical advances like you know mm -hmm. there's there's like the, like uh what the cat scans these these are things that also came from space exploration it's it's so much more you know i mean it's almost kind of like if i if, if i was if i lived in like a building okay where that's kind of like where i was stuck yeah. my, my entire life and i knew i could go out but i didn't know what was out there mm-hmm I think people would end up trying to go out and see like, hang on a second. I do want to know what we're in. Right. Cause it's like this huge mm -hmm. thing. And now we do know that we're in this giant universe. That's like mind blowingly vast, like so bigger than we can ever imagine. And so we're just trying to study the little side of it that we're in so that we can figure out more about our planet. If we know how planets evolve in general, if we know how life can form on other planets, if we know more about, um, about like how they form that can tell us a lot about our own planet so these are actually mm -hmm. things that will give us tangible results or tangible things that we can actually use practically in our life and we do every day gotcha can we talk about specifics of this mission too because i know a lot of it is devoted to finding signs of ancient life on mars um and there was a great editorial in the new york times recently too about like why mars and is actually a good place to do this because it is so frigid and so cold and things can be preserved but yeah, can you talk a bit about that, that mission and what NASA is trying to learn from all this? Yeah. So um, like, for example, Mar Mars is one of the one of the planets that are kind of in a habitable zone. The other one is mm -hmm. Venus, which is scorching hot. <laughs> and so yeah. the last time I think I think Russia tried to drop a, a, a probe into into mm -hmm. Venus, it just got crushed. <laughs> like, so, and it, you know, it just melted away and got crushed because there's huge pressure and and intense heat over there and so because because it, it's like a it's a sort of runaway greenhouse effect that keeps going yeah. on and so that's not a good place to look <laughs> so mm -hmm. mars is um it has it has temperatures that are that are you know that are good for 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 uh for spacecraft or like rovers that we send and such um it has some atmosphere it's one percent of earth but it still has some atmosphere and we found things like you know, like, like the way that the way that the, the land is sort of worn away is like, that can only be done by water. Yeah, and so, yeah. and so, yeah, so we found that that this is like, every, you know, a lot of things hit towards the possibility of there having been life. And so, so in this mission, they want to actually find that. So they're going to be looking mm -hmm. like through minerals and, and different things like that to see if there are any or, or to find any ancient signs of life that they can. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that makes the, I mean, that makes this mission. And, and then, of course, the Martian soil that they're going to bring back over here for us to to study. It's uh, <laughs> there's just so many cool things in this mission. I just, That's I, so cool. Yeah. Is there anything specific about the location where they landed? Because it is a basin, right? So it's somewhere, it's some place where they believe there was a lot of water at one point. And if there's a lot of water, there is probably a lot of life forming them early life, maybe something even you know more complex than we expect. Uh, but is that can you tell us about the location of where it landed to? Yeah, so it landed on um, Jezero Crater, mm -hmm. which uh, and that's 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 the site that's the site that it's gonna that's that it's gonna um, use to or to study and to like pick up its samples and such. And yeah, because because it it does look like there might have been water there, and so that was a good site to land at mm -hmm. for them to gotcha. do all this. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah, it's uh, it's so exciting. Um, and also because we're in gadget. We cannot help but look at the tech specs <laughs> of this uh, of this rover, uh, and NASA actually put out like a major, almost like a product page for this thing, right? Where they describe the rover brains. It's a processor that has a, it's a radiation hardened central processor with Power PC 750 architecture, um, a BAE Rad 750. Uh, by the way, shouting out Power PC 750. That is the same hardware that was at the heart of the G3 Max from the early 2000s. So. Kind of a uh, kind of funny to see 
you know that earlier tech uh, show up in space. It operates at a speed up to 200 megahertz, um, 10 times faster than the Spirit and Opportunity computers. It has two gigabytes of flash memory, two fi- 256 megabytes of dynamic random access memory, and 256 kilobytes of electrically erasable programmable read-only memory. So this may, it feels like a very low-spec computer, but I guess that is what we can safely send to Mars, right? That will actually survive the radiation and the the cold and everything, right? Exactly. And so, I mean, I mean, you can either be impressed or disappointed. I think impressed <laughs> by by a mission like that being run by like essentially a, a Pentium One, which is from 1992, um, <laughs> and. And or impressed, well, impressed with that, but or disappointed because you would think mm-hmm. that you know it has more. But the thing is, the 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 thing that they know about about this about this processor is that it's reliable. It mm-hmm. will protect. It will protect this this stuff from from the intense radiation that's going to have to deal with. And okay, I think like over uh, uh, several hundred missions in space are using this this uh, processor, and so it's it's reliable, and mm-hmm. um, and it uses very little power. Yes, we okay. were limited with power, so I know. Um, I know that it's that that perseverance is carrying with it some. I think like eleven pounds of plutonium, and so plutonium has it kind of naturally naturally undergoes radio radioactive decay, which releases heat, and that uh-huh. heat it converts to electricity. But remember, I said eleven pounds. That means it's limited, and so eventually it's going to deplete. Uh-huh. So we don't want to. We don't want to have you know, processes eating up too much power so that, you know, we want to extend the mission as long as possible. And so, you know, you look at, I mean, you look at that and, you know, you might say, (laughs) you might say that you might be disappointed, but if then compared to like the Voyagers, uh, which were launched in like what, 1970s, Uh uh (laughs) the Voyagers were, they had what, I think almost set like less, like about 70 kilobytes and of, of memory and, um, and half a megabyte of storage. (laughs) <laughs> half a megabyte of storage all i think all my pictures are bigger than that and so uh-huh. <laughs> you know <laughs> uh. so it's like it's still in terms of space flight it's 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 uh it's not it's not so updated from past miss- missions but it's but it's reliable and it's um it works mm-hmm. We've come a long way, certainly, in, on the tech <laughs> side. The NASA describes the rover's body as the warm electronics box, or WEB for short. Like a car body, they say it's a strong outer layer that protects the rover's computer and electronics. Uh, I'd say go look at some photos of the stuff uh, on NASA's site because the rover itself looks like a, um, you know, like a Wally. It looks like Wally from the Pixar movie who's kind of spread out with wheels and it's just kind of like janky and put together, but. It is not, it's not a polished thing. And you look at a lot of space work, it doesn't look like consumer polish, but it, it's made to withstand everything, right? This is a tough, tough machine. Yeah, it's, 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 um, it's made to withstand a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, like the, the, the primary thing that you're going to deal with in space is, is um, cosmic radiation and radiation in space. Mm-hmm. And so everything that's on that's on this rover has to be able to withstand that and so it's encased in in a protective in a protective shield uh, the the processor comes with this like as you said radio like it's it's like a radiation hardened and so it's, it just protects from that from that and cuz we we need that like that's that's the biggest that's one of the biggest problems as well in terms of like space in, in, in human space flight to mars is that we need to figure out how to protect things <laughs> from yeah. radiation well yes Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so now that it's on the planet, it does seem like NASA is slowly getting more information. I guess it, t- it certainly takes a while for data and observational stuff to make it back to Earth. But they did release on the second day the sound of Mars. And it is a very eerie thing. Let's take a just close your eyes, everybody. Take a minute and listen to this because I think it is a, it, it's just a fascinating thing to hear. Let's roll that audio. Um, I invite you now to, if you would like to close your eyes and just imagine yourself sitting on the surface of Mars and listening to to the surroundings. Uh, If I could have that first one, please. So that gentle whirl that happens in the background, that is a noise made by the rover. 
But yes, what you did here 10 seconds in was an actual wind gust on the surface of Mars, picked up by the microphone, sent back to us here on Earth. The analysis indicates that was around a five meter per second type of wind gust. Um, so we have actually, we can sit here now and, and actually tell you that we have recorded sound from the surface of Mars. So we have That's a second one, which basically further reduced the noise of the rover. So you can just hear uh, what the wind would sound like on Mars. And once again, I invite you to, to sit back and uh, have a listen to what it would sound like to be on Mars. There it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I love it. It's a, it's a weird noise because it's almost what I, I've been to like some areas that aren't quite deserts, but like if you go out in the middle of nowhere and like in Nevada or something, like you can start to just hear wind. There's no trees rustling. There's like not much else except for like that gentle wind. And yeah, you just kind of feel it. It may not sound like much at first. How did you feel hearing that, Sophia? Oh, I, I just, I was, I mean, to be frank, I, I lost it. I was like, oh my <laughs> goodness, we got sound on Mars. And this is like, you know, this is real sound. Like if, if you are on social media, you probably saw this tweet that went viral with mm -hmm. a video, um, you know, claiming that that was, the, that was sound on Mars. That was actually, I think, curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, none of the missions that are on Mars now have a microphone except for, for Perseverance. And so... That's not, <laughs> that definitely wasn't it. It wasn't perseverance and it was not the sound on Mars. So getting this was just incredible. It's like the first time that we can hear sound on another planet, which is so huge mm -hmm. because, you know, we know that in space, you can't hear anything. Okay. You, in space, because, because sound needs a medium to prop, propagate in. And in space, you don't have one. It's essentially close. To, it's, it's as close you can get to a vacuum. Whereas on Mars, we do have a little bit of atmosphere. And so you will be able to hear stuff. And that's that's it. Like, we, we got to hear sound on another planet. So <laughs> it made me feel wonderful. I don't know. It made me feel like like it was kind of like like the reality of opening, like, doors to, to the future of ex, uh, space exploration. And so this is just – this mission is just all about that to me. <laughs> and so I'm just really, really excited about it. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I know you have to go soon. Uh, I'm just wondering, last question for you. What are you looking forward to, you know, from this mission? What sort of data, what sort of more insights are you really excited to see soon from NASA? Because I'm sure there's a lot of stuff to you that is like 10 years out, right? The helicopter. I want to see if it flies. <laughs> I want to see it again. So I think it's charging right now. Um, yep. I think I think it's going to be charging for about 30 to 60 days, depending on what um, I, I think it was like 30 to 60. Yeah, so it's sitting there charging. It's getting um, recharged by Perseverance. And then the flight starts. And so um, I'm really excited for that. Keep your eyes out for that. It's going to be the first time that we have a helicopter on another planet flying, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Everything crossed. Uh, toes crossed and all, too. Thank you so much, Sophia, for joining us and explaining all this for us. Where can people find your work on the Internet and follow you and everything? I'm Astro Parta Girl everywhere, so it's like it's like Astro Particle, but instead of the C L E, it's girl. Uh -huh. <laughs> so Astro Parta Girl, Twitter, um, TikTok yep. now, Instagram, Facebook, and I do have a I have a website as well. Um, it's not so you can actually use it to like mostly contact me. It's not super updated, but I will be updating that as well. Um, but that's but my social media, I'm, I'm all over it. So sure, for sure, I first read that as Astro Party Girl, and I saw on your website that you definitely. Uh, yeah, you clarify that, but I think either way works, right? Astro party. I love space party parties. Girl. I'm totally happy space with that. Parties. It's just yeah, <laughs> it's just that yeah, it's a, it's uh, yeah, I'm 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 okay with either. It's uh, it's just I like to I like people to know where yeah. it comes from because it's like the astro particle part. But yeah, I'm totally happy with space parties. I I would jam that one no and no problem. Awesome. So. Thank you so much. I hope to chat again with you on the Yeah to Podcast. Thank you.